Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku and Momo were trapped in a dangerous world part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Introduction Covered in almost shredded in dirty clothes, sat a denizen of the street, abandoned by humanity by his own choice. The images he saw drove him to the brink of insanity. His quirk caused his madness, for it allowed him to see into another plane of existence while he slept or more recently while he was awake. Asakaki Tashinaki knew he could go there again, for he had gone there once before when he was younger. His stay had been brief though and to this day he still carried the scars he had acquired from some diminutive monsters called Goblin. It had been a true nightmare when he arrived there. For as he visited a village he had found he was forced to witness and be a victim of the brutality the monsters conducted. He had barely escaped the fate of those of a small village, returning back to his own world, never realizing that because he did go, his mind now was open to perceive that world in his dreams. To his dismay it was not normal images and dreams that plagued him. No that would be fine. What he was assaulted with was images that were of slaughter, murder and rape. Images that sickened him to his core and they would not stop. If he had any idea of what would happen, he would never have gone there. Upon his return then his parents believing he was not sane because of his wounds and believing he inflicted them on himself, they attempted to send him to a care facility. Instead of going, he ran away from home and sought refuge on the street, begging for money to feed himself and living in whatever shelter he could find. Accidental confrontation. Izuku Midoriya was in hell. He had to wonder why Mr. Iwaza would subject him to what he now endured, which in his estimates was the worst thing that could happen to him. In truth he had gotten better being around his female classmates, though he did stutter and stammer most of the time when he was forced to speak to them. Know what made the situation hard on him, was he was on the training patrol with Momo Yeirazu and to him that was a major problem. Anyone else would have been easier on him, even Katsuki Bakugo. No, he had been paired with Momo Yeirazu who happened to be perhaps the prettiest girl at UA. He had in all the time he had known her, never been alone with her and he strove to keep it that way. Just like with any of the other girls in his class. Thankfully at that moment, the only thing that made the whole situation bearable was that it was 20 degrees out, so he did not have deal with Momo wearing her skimpy hero uniform. They both had to wear appropriate winter clothing, though to his horror. She wore something that definitely showed just how attractive her body was. Black knee-high boots, tight blue jeans and a black parka coat that was at least two sizes too small. He marveled on how even in winter garb she could look so incredible. I think it is getting colder Midoriya. She commented blowing on her exposed hands then removed a pair of gloves from the pocket of her coat and put them on. This was the third time she attempted to strike up a minimal conversation with him and all he did was simply not. He could not bring himself to respond anything more than that. Glancing at his watch he swallowed heavily. We only have two more hours, and the patrol is over for today. Izuku whispered softly and Momo looked over at him with interest, finding it pleasant that he finally had said something to her. It bothered her that he was so uncomfortable talking to her. She wanted to confront him about that. After all they were at the very least more than just classmates, but on patrol was no the right time to confront him. She would do it later, especially since they were scheduled to conduct the same type of patrol for the next week and she had no intention of repeating what they went through today to continue. Yes Kyoka Jiro and Tenya Ida will relieve us, Momo said back, then something caught her eye. One of the locals appeared to be avoiding them completely. Sure most of those that lived within the area did the same, but this one seemed to be really suspicious about it. The dirty black-bearded man lowered his head and seemed to almost run to the shadows of an alley. You see him? She asked Izuku who nodded. Think we should check him out. At most check to see if he is alright. Izuku said now his voice no longer low and Momo smiled slightly, finding Izuku's hero mode interesting since it was completely different than his normal mode. I will call it in. Momo tapped her earwick. Mr. Snipe, this is Yeirazu. I am with Midoriya and we are at the corner of K Street and what looks like our street. There is a suspicious individual across the street from us. We are going to check him out, she said to the pro hero that was keeping a discreet eye on them. She looked over at Izuku. Mr. Snipe is reminding us to be careful and if it turns hazardous dot 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 we are to back off. She told him and Izuku nodded, then whispered something and she watched as green electricity began to sparkle around him. She knew he had just powered up and she suspected that it was only about 10%. She had witnessed firsthand what happened when he tried to access anything above 20% and it was not good. Broken bones and damaged tissue was the usual result. Keep a little behind me Yeirazu. Izuku said sternly and Momo winced, though she decided it might be a good idea. If it turned violent then she needed to keep out of Izuku's way. 
At the same time she could create a few defensive items that would aid him if the man did turn out to be dangerous. Steadying themselves they walked towards the suspicious man. The man saw them and both knew that he was considering running for it. Excuse me sir, are you alright? Izuku asked pleasantly and the man glared at him. No, leave me alone. The man demanded sternly and kept glancing about nervously. Sweat began to form on his forehead as his eyes darted from down the alley and back at the two UA students. Easy sir dot 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 we are from the UA Hero School and all we want to do is make sure you are alright. Izuku said calmly about to move closer. Momo stopped him with a restraining hand on his left forearm. She did not like the feeling she was getting off the man before them. Do not get too close to him is. Midoriya. Snipe is on his way. Momo whispered to him and Izuku gave a subtle nod. Stay away from me. The man screamed, retreating backwards until he pressed himself against a building wall behind him. Both UA students kept their distance. The man's eyes went wild in panic. Wait you are heroes. No you are not taking me. I will not go. You should have left me alone. The man warned, his voice now sounding as if he was not really speaking to them anymore. We do not mean you any harm sir, Momo said from behind Izuku. But the man simply started to laugh and it was not a pleasant sounding laugh. Then he swept his right arm towards them and both noticed the strange orange-blue energy pulsating from his hand. Be gone to never return. You will not plague me ever again. The man roared and before Izuku could react he felt a strange sensation envelop his body. He heard Momo gasp painfully and he knew she was experiencing it as well. The sensation of the energy hurt. Stinging prickles ran all over him and Izuku had to squeeze his eyes shut. The next thing he felt was the ground as he fell against it and to his surprise it felt like grass. But he could not be certain because he could not really see yet or even move. The tingling started to reduce and within seconds he could see again. Sitting up, he waited for his eyes to focus and when he opened them, he could not fully believe or comprehend what had happened. He was in an open foot high grassy field near a huge forest. Oh my god. He heard Momo say in utter shock from behind him. He turned and then stared in disbelief at what he saw over her shoulder and above them. Two moons overhead. One red and one green. The other world. They both sat there for several minutes staring at their unfamiliar surroundings. Still astonished about the fact wherever they were, there were two moons. I do not think we are on Earth anymore. Well our Earth. Momo said finally and Izuku had to agree with that. She pulled off her parka and set it besides her. Izuku then did the same. They had left a place where it was cold and now they were somewhere that the temperature was at least 40 degrees warmer. I believe we should stay here as long as we can. Perhaps Mr. Snipe can. I don't know get that man to bring us home. Izuku suggested and Momo nodded. That was probably their only hope to get home. Though she doubted that was even possible not after hearing the deranged man tell them to be gone and never return. Those words stuck in her head. I will agree to that. But only until morning. That is if this place has a morning. If it does we cannot remain here for a long period of time after that. From the indications and the fact that it is a great deal warmer here. It could get considerably hotter here and we have no water or food. Momo advised and Izuku swallowed heavily. What she said was true. At that point we should seek out any type of civilization. How do you know if there is any civilization here? Izuku asked in concern and Momo smiled. She pointed over to the right several yards away and he noticed the dirt road that seemed to go for miles in both directions. Oh, he said with embarrassment. He had not noticed the road. They sat there for what felt like hours but according to Izuku's watch it was only two hours and the sun began to rise. He adjusted the time. Using the fact that the sun rose at home around 5 a.m. standing he exhaled sharply with a deep sigh. Momo stood as well, then created a red flag and a black magic marker. Which way should we go? Momo asked and Izuku shrugged. Removing a coin out of his pocket he showed it to her. Heads that way. Izuku pointed to the right down the road. Tails that way. He pointed left. She nodded, flipping the coin. Heads dot 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 that way it is. He gestured with his thumb to the right. Momo drew a black arrow on the flag and then placed their initials on it. He immediately understood. If somehow Snipe or one of the other pro heroes somehow got the man to reopen whatever he used to send them here and they came here to search for them, the flag would indicate where the two had gone. She stuck it into the ground and picked up her parka. Izuku did the same. Then they were on their way. She found it interesting that due to the situation they were in, that Izuku was able to speak to her without stuttering or stammering. Then she realized that he was probably still in his hero mode and not his normal mode. At some point she guessed he would revert back to where he barely could speak to her. Though she hoped that he would become comfortable enough around her not to do that. An hour later or what Izuku's watch indicated it to be an hour later, they came across a stream. Momo created a water test strip and checked the water to make sure it was safe to drink. Which it was. They both drank and she then created two gallon canteens. Do not overdo it. Izuku advised unsure how much longer she could continue to create things without getting something to eat real soon. He felt hungry and he was sure she had to feel the same. I am good for a few more minor items. Momo said then her stomach rumbled. 
Okay I am hungry, but I have enough stored limpets so don't worry. She told him and Izuku shook his head. A stream could mean fish. We could stay here long enough for me to find out. Izuku suggested and Momo smiled. Good idea. While you do that, I will see about starting a fire. Just in case you do catch something. Momo stood and after finding a good spot, which happened to be where someone else had already had a campfire, she gathered kindling and some wood. With almost the last of her stored limpets, she created a small lighter. Thankfully at that moment, Izuku came over carrying two foot long sized fish. Using her last limpets, she made a tester to check the fish for any type of poisons or toxin. Oh good dot dot they are safe. They both ate, but Izuku made sure to give half of his fish to Momo, with the excuse that she needed to have enough saturated fat so if necessary she could continue to create things they might need. Drinking their fill once more from the stream, they filled the canteens and continued their journey. They walked in near silence and after another mile, Momo had enough of that. Can we? I don't know dot 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 talk, she said and Izuku looked over at her. Then she saw it, he had reverted back. Hey, hey, about what? Izuku stuttered and Momo gave a soft chuckle. Ah uh, back to normal are we? Momo asked with a small smile and he nervously looked over at her. You know at some point Midoriya you need to get where you can talk to me without stuttering. Though I do find it kind of cute. This made him almost trip on the uneven dirt road. I dot dot I dot 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 will try not to. Izuku said blushing slightly and Momo shook her head, still smiling. So mid dot 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 wait can we dot 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 can we call each other by our surname? Since we have no idea how long we are going to be here and I want to believe that we are dot dot well that we are not just classmates but friends. Momo asked and Izuku inhaled softly, then nodded. Izuku, have always wanted to know. She pointed down to his scarred hands and forearms. Your quirk has a very extreme and harmful effect on you. Why is that? She asked and he paled slightly. I am working on that. But my quirk is too powerful for my body to handle it completely. I am able to use a small percentage of it dot dot at most 20% without it breaking my bones, though it does hurt. Izuku said not stuttering at all and Momo discovered a method of conversation that might bring him out of his stuttering. Well can I suggest something? While here we have no idea if there is any type of medical assistance they might have, so it might be advisable not for you to cause any type of permanent harm upon yourself. Unless it is a dire situation dot dot you might not want to cause yourself anything that breaks bones. Momo said and Izuku slowly nodded. We could be somewhere that the doctors simply cut off broken digits instead of setting them. She added and Izuku paled. You might be right about that. Izuku said looking down at his hands. The thing is dot 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 we have no idea what we might encounter here. I might have to go all out to at least protect ourselves. True. But until we do dot 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 we should strive not to get into any situation unless it is direly necessary. Life and death type of situation. Momo advised then another thought came to her and she changed the subject. Umizuku dot 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 if there are people here. I doubt that they will speak Japanese. Do you know and speak any other language other than Japanese? She asked him. I took the required term of American English in middle school. And that is about it. Izuku replied and Momo bit her bottom lip. You, same, though I have been there four times in the last five years on vacation. I can speak it rather effectively. Mom did not mention she could also speak Italian and French on a limited basis. So if the people here speak Japanese or English then we should be alright. They actually had no idea what they spoke. That did concern her somewhat. Of course they did not know until they actually came across someone and tried to talk to them. Is that a crossroad up ahead? Izuku asked pointing further down the road where they both saw another road cross over the one they were on. Looks like it dot 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 hey there is a sign on the corners. Momo said and they quickened their pace. At the first sign, she sighed heavily. The letters on it were worn down and she could not even tell what it said. Going to another, again the sign had been worn down. Izuku had gone over to one of the others and then shook his head. They both went over to the last sign and she smiled. If I am reading this right and it is in English dot 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 that way is Watertown. Wait could this be the United States? When I went there, I turned around New York and there is a city called Watertown. Could that man have transported us there? She asked him and Izuku shook his head. I have no idea, though it is possible. Izuku hopefully said, though he somewhat doubted that. For one they had not heard or seen any planes overhead. Then there was the fact that the dirt road was well maintained, but there were no signs of truck or car tires, so he doubted that they were in New York State. It was nice to hope so. Momo looked closer at the sign. Problem though dot dot if I am reading this right. Watertown is a good 120 miles that way. It would take us a week to get there. Momo commented and gestured at the other signs. I think we should go in a different direction and hope that we find something closer. She suggested and Izuku had to agree. For one they did not know what was in that direction. They could travel that way and not come across any food or water. Then they would be really in trouble. So which way do we go? Izuku asked pointing at the two other directions. Not wanting to backtrack from the way they came and not wanting to flip a coin again. That seemed foolish at this point. 
Momo looked in both directions and then pointed to the left. Those are mountains over that way. I think we should go that way. Momo said and Izuku looked at her confused. What I betting on is that there has to be civilization that way. Look at the road dot dot it is heavily traveled that way. She indicated the grooves embedded into the road that went towards or from the mountains. You are right. At the very least it might be cooler that way. Izuku said and wiped sweat of his forehead. The temperature had risen to about 90 degrees with the hot sun beaming down at them. With the direction set, they began to walk towards the mountains in the distance. Zero, arriving just in time to watch as Midoriya and Yeirazu disappeared in a flash of energy. Snipe confronted the disheveled man and with the arrival of Awaza were able to neutralize him. Standing over the unconscious man, the two watched as other heroes interviewed anyone nearby, hoping to determine what had happened. Midnight soon joined them and from what Awaza could see from her expression, she did not have good news. Those two over there said they saw the whole thing. It seems this guy here enveloped Midoriya and Yeyurazu in some type of energy and then they were gone. They did hear him tell them right before the man there ranted about something in the lines of begone and never return. You will plague me never again. Or something in that regard. She told the two other teachers. Do you think that maybe he somehow sent them somewhere? That his quirk transported them somewhere else? Snipe asked hoping that was the case. Otherwise he would hold him responsible for what had occurred. He wanted to believe that was what happened and not that the man had not simply killed them. From what I heard from other witnesses dot 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 it could be possible. We won't know until he wakes up and we can interrogate him. Midnight said and also hoped that was the case. If he did, then he should be able to bring them back. Or at least tell us where he sent them if he did transport them elsewhere that is. Awaza stated ready and willing to force the man to cooperate. He had no intention of informing Yeyarazu's parents and Midoriya's mother that they had no idea where the two students were. Later to their dismay the deranged man refused to tell them anything other than he sent the two teenagers where they would never bother him again. They would never find them and he would never bring them back. Twilight on the road. Off in the distance, the sun began to set and Izuku groaned slightly. They had been walking for hours and still the mountains loomed before them. Far off into the distance. I thought by now we would at least be at the mountains. He commented and Momo giggled. Those mountains are probably huge, so they look closer than what they truly are. I would make a guess that we are most likely at least two more days away from the edge of that big one there. Momo informed him pointing at the center mountain that sat before them. Moving on they found a cluster of trees and decided to camp there for the night. Making a campfire, they used their parkas as blankets and leaned back against a tree next to each other. The moons had risen and Izuku looked up at them. It is so weird to see two moons at night, Izuku said as Momo looked up at them as well. The two do give off enough moonlight that it is not pitch black out at night. Momo said and pulled her parka more tightly around her. The temperature had begun to drop and even with the fire it felt colder. Shivering slightly she looked over at Izuku. Knowing what she was about to suggest would probably send him back into a stuttering stammering wreck. It is getting colder. I think we should share dot 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 body heat. She said and blushed slightly. He paled and began to breathe hard in and out. He swallowed heavily. H. How would we do dot 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 that? Izuku gasped out and Momo smiled, finding it funny. She edged closer and took his parka from him throwing it over their legs, then used hers to cover their upper bodies. This is how, uh, it does feel a bit warmer now, Momo said and leaned her head onto his shoulder. She felt his whole body tense at the contact, though after a few minutes he seemed to relax somewhat. We better get some sleep and hope that tomorrow we reach some type of civilization. She added hoping to make Izuku more comfortable with her so close to him. He still was tense but his breathing was more even. Yes let's hope. I do not know about you M. M. Momo. But I am starting to get hungry, Izuku said stuttering on her name, not used to actually saying it out loud. Momo inhaled softly and nodded. The fish they had earlier that morning was all they had so far and after the long hike they had taken, both of their reserves were low. She knew she probably could not create anything too elaborate until she ate something soon. Sleep soon beckoned to them both and they dozed off into a slumber. Night of terror, sleeping against a tree and having the prettiest girl that Izuku had ever seen, snuggling against him, was not entirely restful. So when he suddenly heard a blood-curdling scream echo across the open plains, it was not hard to miss. His eyes opened and he listened now fully awake. Did you hear that? Momo asked him sitting up from her position of leaning heavily against him. Yes, Izuku responded and then they heard another and then another, each one echoing from off in the distance. Standing he concentrated on trying to see where it came from as did Momo. She closed her eyes and listened more intently. Another scream came and she inhaled softly, maybe about two or three miles that way. Momo said and opened her eyes again. More screams seemed to resound from the same direction. We need to go. If someone is in trouble we should try to help them. Izuku said to her and Momo nodded. Picking up their parkas they began to walk as fast as they could on the road towards the sound of screaming. I could dot 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 you know activate about 10% and 
He blushed and at first Momo was going to chuckle at how embarrassed he seemed to be. But neither knew what the situation was further on and from what they heard it had to be serious. Do you think you can carry me that far without getting tired? Momo asked and Izuku nodded. Okay let's do it. People are in trouble and I for one think it is no time to be embarrassed or self-conscious about you carrying me. With that he picked her up bridal style, went to 10% and bolted down the road. She held on to him with her arms around his neck and was amazed on how fast he could run, even with his face a deep shade of red. Two hours after darkness descended upon small mound village, the goblins attacked, entering the outer small houses that faced the mountains, slaughtering men and taking women captive, though some were violated as soon as the goblins found them. During this, the village became alerted and began to defend themselves. But it was pointless. There were at least 50 of the monsters already inside the village, so the defenders had no real chance, especially since there was four hobgoblins to ensure resistance was impossible. A snickering goblin dragged a young red-haired girl out of her house. Her mother had her head bashed in and her father had been cut apart by other goblins. The gleefully evil creature continued to laugh, right up to when a new arrival smashed him so hard he flew across the narrow street and impacted against a stone wall. This alarmed the other goblins as they all looked towards the source of the attack to see a young boy and a young woman standing there. When Izuku and Momo arrived they could not help but notice the carnage before them. Short green creatures were savagely slaughtering whoever they could, cutting and stabbing what the two could tell were humans. In their hesitation and shock at what they saw, another man screamed as two of the monsters brutally cut him apart. Momo felt ill, turning towards Izuku. The gloves are off on these things. Izuku. We need to take them down hard. She said grinding her teeth. Looking over they saw one of the monsters dragging a girl not much older than them out of a small house. The girl was screaming, begging for help as the thing began to tear her nightgown off her. So basically I show no mercy. Izuku stated wondering why he did not have a problem with that. Momo see to her and the others. I will take care of. Whatever these things are. Izuku declared and Momo had to agree. Especially since she could not create anything at the moment. So instead she picked up a broken spear and held it confidentially. Okay Izuku. But be careful, Momo advised, helping the red-haired girl up and led her over towards some other villagers that were huddled nearby, standing ready to defend them if necessary. Watching as two of the larger creatures stride towards Izuku, your dot 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 your comrade should be careful. Those hobgoblins are dot 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 they are worse than the other goblins. They are stronger, one of the women said to her and Momo smiled at her. I am not worried, Izuku dot 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 well Izuku is extremely strong, Momo said to the older woman, then with a downward slash of the staff she held. She smacked two of what she now knew was goblins hard one of them across the head and the other she rammed just as hard it in the chest with the broken end of the spear, knocking both away effortlessly. Noting that the short green monsters were much weaker than she was, she had to guess that they attacked their victims with superior numbers. That was their advantage against larger and stronger opponents. Glancing back to watch as Izuku basically threw one of the larger brutes into over a dozen of the smaller goblins a good 50 meters away. This alarmed the goblins as a good portion of them turned and ran. The other large hobgoblin lunged at him and Izuku easily stopped its blow by grabbing its right wrist. At first it had a murderous large smile on its hideous face and then it seemed to panic as it tried to pull his arm out of Izuku's grip. With a left straight arm punch, Izuku smashed the thing right into its face, squishing its nose almost flat and the force of the blow sent it to crash hard into and through one of the small houses. It dropped in a bloody heap, turning towards the smaller creatures and the two remaining larger ones, he gestured at them. Next, he said and the rest bolted in panic dropping weapons and fleeing as fast as they could. With the attack over, Izuku and Momo helped with the wounded. Momo was able to grab something to eat which was offered by one of the survivors after she told them that she was starving and felt weak, so began to create as many bandages as she could. Some of the other villagers began to carefully move their dead off to one side and it sickened Izuku on how many there were. At the same time the men stacked the dead goblins and the two hobgoblins in a pile, splashing some type of dark liquid on the pile and setting them on fire. Near dawn, slumping against a wall, the two both felt exhausted. An elderly man approached them. We need to thank you adventurers. If you had not come when you did, a great number of us would be dead or captured by those goblins. The grey-bearded man said leaning heavily on his walking stick. Adventurers, what are they? Momo asked snacking on some bread that one of the other women had given her. The man looked at her confused. To reduce the confusion Izuku told the man their predicament that they were not residents of this world. The man was still confused but then told them about the adventurers and everything he knew about the goblins. Near noon and now provisioned with two backpacks, blankets and some travel rations, things that they tried not to take when offered in gratitude from the villagers, the pair was on their way, now with a clear idea where they should go, a nearby town that laid several miles further on. There they would be able to talk to something that the villagers called the Adventurer's Guild, 
With adequate limpets within her, Momo had to create something that she would have to create from memory. Concentrating on the creation, she soon removed a 9mm Beretta pistol from her stomach. The next thing she made was two magazines and 30 rounds of ammunition. Loading the magazines, she slapped one of them into the pistol and slipped in into her belt, wanting something that would be completely effective against anything including more goblins. Izuku stared at the weapon she made in shock. What, if we come across those things again? I want something that will make them think twice about attacking me or you. She told him and he had to admit, the pistol would do that. Not that she was a supporter of capital punishment even when defending themselves. But after what they had witnessed and experienced, she was more than willing to do so against those monsters. The next thing she made was a half dozen of her specialty. Flash bombs, giving Izuku half of them. She put her own where she could reach them easily. Near noon, Izuku stopped and pointed at a field off to the left. Momo looked at where he was pointing and they saw over two dozen dead goblins, all killed by various different ways. Stepping closer, these look like the same that retreated from the village. He commented pointing at the larger goblin that they had learned was actually a hobgoblin. Its head sat a foot away from its body. Someone took them out, Momo said glancing about, removed her pistol from her belt right-handed and then bent down to pick up a weird-looking arrow. It had a green pine cone attached to where usually an arrowhead would be. She tossed the arrow back down. I think we should move on. They returned to the road and then spotted a group a good mile away, walking in the same direction. Zero. Are they goblins? Goblin Slayer asked peering back towards where they had just took down the horde of goblins in an ambush. The high elf archer shaded her eyes and looked and then shook her head. No, two humans. They had stopped where the goblins are and now they are coming this way. The elf said then frowned. Neither seems to be carrying any type of weapon. She added with some concern. Maybe we should wait for them. There might be more goblins around. The blonde teenager priestess asked not wanting to be the reason for someone being attacked by the dangerous monsters. If we waited it would give us a perfect chance to eat. The dwarf stated, hoisting up his traveling bag and then the cask that contained alcohol. Like you need a reason to stuff yourself and make yourself even broader. The elf said with a smirk and the dwarf went to sit down on the side of the road. But I guess we could do with a small repast. Moving to join the dwarf, pulling out some elvish travel rations, holding one out to her now best friend the priestess, who sat down next to the 2,000-year-old elf. The two had become closer over the past few months and the much younger girl even now roomed with the elder elf woman back at the city. Do we have any cheese? The lizard man asked and after digging into the bag, the dwarf held out a wheel of cheese, which the lizard took. Of course scaly. The dwarf laughed as the lizard shaman grabbed the cheese gleefully. On nectar of the gods, the lizard man said as he took a huge bite of his now favorite food. With ice cream a close second, I guess we are waiting then. Goblin Slayer said joining them taking a strip of ration jerky from the bag and taking a good swig from his water skin. It did not take long for the two others to approach them. Bounding up from where she sat next to her friend the elf, the priestess smiled happily at the two other teenagers. Greetings, the priestess said smiling and quickly introduced her party to the two, who introduced themselves back as Izuku Midoriya and Momo Yeirazu, which confused her party as they tried to think what the two could be. Is that your occupation or what you are known for? because I have never heard of what an Izuku Midoriya is or a Momo Yeirazu. Have any of you? The high elf asked wiggling her ears. No, Izuku Midoriya is my name and that is Momo Yeirazu. Don't you have names? Izuku asked just as confused as the ones before him seemed to be. Oh I think I now understand. The blonde girl priestess said as she gestured at her party. Yes at one time we all had names. But when we selected our path we forego those names for what we are. For example when I became a priestess for the one god and then an adventurer. I then no longer will be known or go by that name, she explained and the two looked at her oddly. So it is a custom here, Momo asked and the other girl nodded. Thinking back at the village, she had not really thought it strange when none of the villagers introduced themselves with names. Instead they gave some type of titles. She believed it had to be so she would know what they did and wanting to be referred as. Okay then dot 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 you can call me Creative. She said even though she was still did not fully understand, there had to be others that went by priestess or high elf. She wondered if so then it had to be confusing. And I am Deku, Izuku announced and was just as confused as Momo was. But if that was how they called themselves here, then they would have to do the same. No names but some type of titles. It seems strange that you are traveling without any weapons. There are goblins and other horrors that you would fall prey to rather easily if you are not armed. Goblin Slayer stated and Momo looked over at Izuku who nodded with approval. I for one am armed and is for Deku. I guess I better tell you all of it. With that Momo told where they were from and what had happened to them including the confrontation with the goblins at the village. After telling them, she pulled out her pistol and showed it to them. This is a semi-automatic 9mm pistol, 
It holds 15 rounds of ammunition and has an effective range of 500 feet and maximum range of 1,400 feet, she said telling them at a guess what she knew about the gun. Whatever that is, I find it difficult to believe that it can be anything as effective as my bow. The high elf said holding up her bow. Momo turned slightly and aimed the pistol at a hanging branch. With a loud bang, she shot the branch and it fell to the ground. Turning again she pointed it at a tree 10 meters away and fired again. The bullet hit the center of the tree and embedded itself deep within it. She then put the pistol back into her belt. I stand corrected. The elf said bowing slightly. The armored helmeted goblin slayer sniffed the air. That is black powder. I once tried to use black powder against a cluster of goblin. It was not effective. Goblin slayer informed them, then wondered if he gave up on the powder that flashed and burned without killing the goblins. It only blinded them momentarily. Yes I guess that is what some call it. Where we are from it is called gunpowder, Momo said and she began to worry if it was a good idea to create something that this world had not even seen before. In a moment of fear of what they had witnessed and experienced she let herself believe that she needed something extreme to protect herself and Izuku. Now after thinking about it she did not want to be the one to all of a sudden elevate the people here into having firearms. It could prove disastrous. With a deep sigh, she pulled the gun out and handed it to Izuku. Crush that Izu. Deku, I think I made a huge mistake making that one. With a nod, Izuku activated 5% of his power and then effortlessly turned the metal gun into a small ball, and stood and threw it as hard as he could. The black metal ball disappeared a good 200 yards away. She then handed him the spare magazine and he first crushed it as well then threw it just as far away. Opening her shirt from the bottom, she concentrated and removed a katana made of carbonized steel out of herself. I think it will be better if I stick to a sword, she said strapping the sword to her hip. That was a good idea Mo. Creati, I was a bit concerned when you made that one. Mostly about what would happen if someone stole it from you and dot 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 well I for one do not want to be responsible for what would happen. Izuku said to her and Momo had to agree with that. It is time to return home, Goblin Slayer said, standing. His mind still whirling with possible ideas on how he could once more use black powder to kill goblins. En route, he remained silent as they walked, while the others spoke to the newcomers about the land, the dangers, the adventurers' guild and other subjects. He listened intently as the two talked about where they were from, along with the marvels that they had, thinking about if any of those marvels would help him kill goblins, though he doubted the thing they called an automobile would work. The girl also informed them how she was able to first make what she called a gun and then later a sword, going into detail about the way she could create things using her limpets and of course telling them what limpets were. Then the boy informed them what he could do and that in itself drew a lot of questions from the others, mostly on how strong and powerful he was. Near the city were the adventurers' guild and what they considered home. The priestess volunteered to guide Momo and Izuku to the guild, since the two seemed interested in becoming adventurers. I should warn you that some of the quests can be deadly, if you do not know what you might be facing. The blonde girl said to them. She exhaled softly and closed her eyes briefly as she walked with them to the center of the small city. On my first adventure, I joined a party of three others and went to confront goblins that had raided a nearby village, taking several girls as playthings. None of us were prepared for what we faced. One of my dot 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 he was cut into pieces, while he was still alive. Another was stabbed with a poison blade and dot 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 and goblin slayer had to dot 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 he told me she would just suffer and die anyway. She said sadly, reaching up to wipe a tear from her cheek. The memory of that day still plagued her. One other survived dot 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 but she was dot 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 she was abused and violated by the goblins. I was lucky that Goblin Slayer arrived otherwise I probably would have shared the same fate. The girl shuddered slightly, then looked at the two. I just hope that you two will be careful. We already saw what those things do or did at that village. I am not completely keen on the idea of killing indiscriminately. We were both trained to become heroes and generally heroes do not kill. Izuku said and the priestess shook her head. I am a priestess of the one god and as such I hate the idea of killing for I was brought up to cherish life. But I learned that it is impossible and deadly to show mercy to goblins. They are pure evil and will turn your mercy against you without hesitation. The priestess told them. Entering the adventurer guild building, she led them to the reception desk where someone she considered as another friend stood behind the desk, commonly referred to as guild girl, completing the application and receiving their porcelain rank tags and told about the rankings above that. The guild girl then led them over to the board where the quests were posted. Now these are the quests, they are updated daily. I would advise that you do not take on any of the bigger quests because of your ranking you might be placing yourself in a very hazardous situation. Work your way up when your skills can handle them. The girl said pleasantly, smiling at Izuku continually. 
She had a thing for Goblin Slayer, but she also found that the one called Deku was nice to look at. Oh also, generally Goblin Slayer likes to take any of those that involve goblins, so you might not want to take any of those. She advised pointing at one that was on the board and her friend the priestess gave a soft sigh. That one is new isn't it? The priestess asked and the guild girl chuckled. Yes, I am sure he will be in later and see it. Then of course he will accept it. The other said and returned to telling the new adventurers about the quests. Izuku read over the one that involved goblins and then looked over at Momo who read it as well. I would not suggest you take that one. From what I know of it, there is an unknown number of goblins involved. The guild girl said not wanting the new adventurers to face something she knew that could be considered that dangerous. If you were thinking about going on that one, after what I told you about goblins, then maybe we should ask Goblin Slayer about you coming with us. Then you will at least have a chance of succeeding. The priestess said, worried that perhaps those that she had just met would meet the same fate of so many others that underestimated the goblin. Did someone mention goblins? Goblin Slayer asked as he walked through the door with the high elf, the dwarf shaman and the lizard priest with him. All four walked up the quest board and upon seeing the posted quest Goblin Slayer took it off the board. At that point the priestess inquired about having Izuku and Momo come with them. That might be a fine idea, the dwarf shaman said with a flamboyant smile. Since we have no idea how many of those loathsome creatures we might face, numbers really did not concern Goblin Slayer, but from what he had gleaned from what he overheard in route, he suspected that the two new adventurers could contribute to eradicating any goblins that he and the others might face. What he had observed, the girl could make whatever she wanted and somehow remove them from herself. The boy on the other hand all he had to go on was what he had heard and that was the young man was incredibly strong, maybe even strong enough to take down a goblin champion. That would make him also useful if it was true. Do you all agree to this? Goblin Slayer asked looking over at the elf and then the lizard man. Both nodded. Then come if you want. We will be leaving in four hours, so rest while you can. With that he headed for the door, while the others decided to get something to eat. In the restaurant, all of them except Izuku watched in awe as Momo ate. I have never seen anyone eat as much as Barrel Belly there does. The elf commented with a chuckle as the dwarf chuckled. Some of us need to indulge when we can. Long ears. For myself I eat to enjoy life in general. Of course someone like yourself rather be so thin that sooner or later you might fall through a crack in the floor. Perhaps that is why unlike this young woman, you are still as flat as a board. The dwarf countered and the elf flung an empty goblet at the dwarf, who ducked and it whizzed over his head. All those at the table chuckled as Momo continued to eat. Like I said before, for me to be able to create, I need to eat and have an abundant amount of limpets. Momo told them reaching over and taking the last three of something that resembled ribs, finishing all that was left over from the meal. When she was finally done it was decided to rest back at the guild hall. There they could sit and relax and wait for Goblin Slayer to return. Those closet to him knew exactly where he had gone. The blacksmith to collect the weapons he had taken there to be repaired. The quest. When Goblin Slayer entered the guild, all noticed that he was carrying a large bag. At their table, he appended the bag onto the table and gestured to the pile. This is old and some of it might need repair, but for now it should be effective enough for the time being. He said to Momo and Izuku. His original party looked at him oddly. They need some type of protection if they are to fight goblins, he told them. When he had visited the blacksmith, he found a small pile of used and discarded armor. Generally some of the more accomplished adventurers would trade in old armor after some time for new armor. The old was still usable in most cases, but it no longer was clean and shiny. The two began to pick through the pieces and he advised them on what they should have, such as they both should wear leather armor, a breastplates, gauntlets, leg and shin greaves along with some type of head protection. Basically they would be wearing light armor. The last thing he did was inform Momo that she needed a much shorter sword. The katana was at least a foot too long. Then he watched in fascination as she opened the bottom of her shirt and removed two shorter versions, both only about a foot and a half long. She took the leather armor and sniffed it. The odor was almost overwhelming. That is some really foul body odor. Momo whispered wrinkling her nose and holding the leather away from her, wondering if she had time to wash it, perhaps create something that would neutralize the smell. Goblin Slayer shook his helmeted head. No, goblins have a keen sense of smell, especially women. It is either the body odor or after we kill a goblin. I cover your smell with blood. Goblin Slayer stated in both the priestess and the elf winced, though they also found it kind of funny. Both tempted to tell Momo or who they knew as Creati, that they had come up with something less foul than goblin blood to cover their smell. A potent concoction that involved a mixture of rotting fish, vinegar and crushed raw onions. With a grimace, Momo slipped the leather armor onto herself, right over her clothes, not wanting to have the foul thing touch more of her skin than necessary. Off to one side Izuku did the same, but he was smirking at her and she gave him a venomous glare, leaving the guild and heading to where the goblins were which would take two days to get there. Momo shifted uncomfortably within her armor, 
Not only did it stink, but it also was stiff and uncomfortable. She promised herself that after this quest, she would create herself something more pleasant to wear. Perhaps something that involved Kevlar in plastic instead of metal. Her thoughts as they walked focused upon whether it was a good idea to destroy the pistol she had made. She still was conflicted. If the goblins were as bad as they were at the village, then she might come to regret having Izuku crush it into a ball. She wished she had her book. Right now she would have to rely upon her memory. Though without the book she could not create the more complex items. The only reason she remembered how to make a 9mm Beretta was because her father had bought an antique pistol that looked nice but could not fire. So she researched the components and created replacement parts. Near dusk, they stopped in a semi-large clearing and Izuku thought it odd. Why don't we camp near the trees over there? He asked thinking it might be easier to collect firewood without hauling it a hundred or so meters. Goblins are sneaky dot 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 they will use the bushes and woods to sneak up on us, ambush us. Here in the open field at least we will be able to see them coming. The priestess explained and Goblin Slayer smiled proudly behind his face guard. That was one of the first things he had taught her when they began to go on quests together. Sounds reasonable. I guess I will haul as much firewood as I can. Izuku said and began to walk towards the trees to collect branches to be used as firewood. I will come with you. The high elf said joining him. Could you tell me more about your world? I find some of the things you have told us fascinating. She said as they walked away and Momo watched them depart, continuing to watch them until they were at the edge of the trees, immediately experiencing a strange sensation within her. One that she had never had before, but she knew what it was. Jealousy. Coming back with armloads of branches, the elf stacked some of them inside a stone ring that the lizard priest had made. Taking out a flint knife she started to strike it against a small stone, creating a spark. Momo knelt next to her. Wait, I have this. It is something I made the first day when we arrived. She pulled out the small lighter and held it under the kindling. With a simple movement with her thumb, the lighter started the fire. She pulled her hand out and everyone was staring at the small two-inch device with interest. What is that thing? Goblin Slayer asked and Momo smiled at him, holding it up so he could see it. It is called a lighter. Inside is a gaseous liquid called butane. Running your thumb over this part creates a spark and the butane ignites. Momo explained and they all those that never seen something like that gasped. So you can create flammable liquids. Goblin Slayer asked. Remember what we told you. The elf stated before the priestess could. No explosives. No fire and no poison. She listed them off on her fingers. I remember. I was only curious. Goblin Slayer said not that any of those that worked with him before actually believed that. They knew at some point he would concoct a way to use any of those listed ways if it meant exterminating goblins the priestess. Dwarf and Lizard Man all chuckled as they shook their heads. If we do not remind him from time to time, Goblin Slayer will forget and try any of those, no matter the consequences. The priestess explained to Momo and Izuku. Yes so we do remind him whenever we can so we do not end up being one of those consequences. The elf added and now Momo and Izuku chuckled as well. Eating some type of stew, Momo ate down two bowls of the plain tasting food, along with several travel biscuits. She glanced over to one side to see her sleeping pad spread out and ready for her to use it. She was tired, not used to walking as far as they had so far. And it had been an early day with her and Izuku rushing to aid the villagers. Cleaning her bowl with a wet cloth, she stood and moved over to her pad, yawning heavily. None of the others said anything as she laid down and after saying goodnight to them she pulled her blanket over. Sleep overtook her a few minutes later, unaware that Izuku volunteered to take her shift at standing watch, convincing the others that she was exhausted and needed the rest. The next day as the sun rose to its highest, they arrived at where Goblin Slayer suspected that the goblin's nest was. Scouting the area, they found no other entrances to the nest. This pose is a problem, Goblin Slayer said gesturing at the cave with his sword. Bastards are learning dot dot the cave entrance is smaller and restrictive. We would have to enter and proceed one at a time which makes it difficult if we are ambushed. He informed them, wishing he had never agreed to not use poison. So what do we do Sir Goblin Slayer? The lizard priest asked sizing up the entrance in comparison to himself. To enter and go inside, he would have to almost crawl on his hands and knees. Goblin Slayer bent over and grabbed some dirt, sprinkling it over the entrance. He watched as the fine mist of dirt drifted into the cave. Smoke. We start a fire outside the entrance and smoke some of them out. Then after we deal with those that come out, we go in to clean out the rest of the nest, Goblin Slayer said, then smiled behind his helm. It is not fire dot dot we will be using just the smoke. He quickly added. The elf spoke up. Yes but it might smother any of their captives inside. The elf said and Momo stepped forward. I can create something a little more effective than smoke and then something that should make it safe to enter. Momo said with a small smile. Turning her back she unlaced the front of her leather armor and hefted up her shirt. The first thing she made was two tear gas grenades and two other type of gas grenades. Replacing her shirt and armor, she handed the first two to Goblin Slayer. 
pull the ring, count to four and then throw both of them inside. Then we might want to step back a few meters. The other did as she said and once done. Everyone took several steps away from the entrance. What were they? I take it as something from your world. Goblin Slayer asked and Momo nodded. Yes those were tear gas grenades. Those two in particular are a pepper spray compressed grenade variation that I have used several times before. Though pepper spray or olorsin capsicum spray is a lacrimatory agent, which is a compound that irritates the eyes to cause a burning sensation, pain, and temporary blindness, Momo said as they all began to hear coughing and goblins screaming inside the cave. They should be coming out any minute now and I am betting that they will not be able to actually see very well. The battle against the couple dozen goblins that came surging out of the cave was more than Izuku or Momo could stand to experience. In truth it was a slaughter and to them they felt sick from all of the blood that was spilled by their comrades. All but the priestess cut down the goblins without mercy, spilling blood everywhere and it was hard for either of them to watch or become involved in. They were training back home to be heroes and generally heroes did not kill. When it was over and all of the coughing and half-blind creatures that stumbled out of the cave were dead. Picking up the grenades, Goblin Slayer walked towards the cave entrance again. He pulled the pins and tossed them inside, returning to where the others waited. If those are effective as the last then this nest will soon be destroyed. So what are those that I just threw inside? He asked and Momo held up her hand and shook her head. She had to take a minute to steady her breathing or she would vomit. I bet those are laughing gas grenades, Izuku said and Momo nodded still having to wait to actually talk. Something that for a while will make the goblins unable to even do more than just laugh. He said to Goblin Slayer, let the gas settle a bit, or we will end up being affected by it as well. He advised, so they waited and then they heard goblins inside laughing hysterically, unable to stop themselves at all. Entering the cave, they had left the lizard priest outside since it was too confined for him to really be effective. Following the cave deeper inside, Goblin Slayer and the lead systematically cut down any they came across effortlessly due to that they all seemed to be almost incapacitated, laughing uncontrollably, counting once more each one he killed. 30 or 40 meters inside the cave, it began to widen larger and the ceiling rose higher upwards. Entering a large chamber, a mage was trying valiantly to recite a spell, but it could not complete it while it laughed. The elf sent an arrow into its forehead ending the attempt. Off behind the mage's throne were two crude doors. That one there is where the baby goblins are dot 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 the other is where they keep their captives. Priestess, high elf dot dot take Deku and create a dot 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 see to the captives. Dwarf make sure there are no more goblins in those side caves over there. Goblin Slayer moved towards the other door that was the nursery, suspecting that none of the others could do what had to be done. There could be no goblin survivors. Leading Momo and Izuku to where the captives were held, the priestess advised them to be ready. The elf notched an arrow just in case. Opening the door, they peered inside to see a half-dozen naked girls tied or chained. Each one did not move much and all of them were heavily abused. To Momo horror each of the girls seemed not to be much older than herself or the priestess. These are the lucky ones. The priestess whispered, checking the nearest and whispering reassuringly to the girl. More than usual, once the goblins are done, playing with them and if they dot 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 if they are not pregnant, they will kill them and eat them. She told them and Momo moved over to another girl placing her hand on the girl's shoulder. Please kill me. The girl whispered to her and Momo shook her head, then decided to create something that would help the girls there for now. A moderate dosage of Xanax piles and then Zolpidum. Take this dot 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 it will make you feel better. Momo told the girl placing one of the white half-inch pile into the girl's mouth. Swallow it, she said and then began to give the other girls the pill. What are they? The elf asked and Momo glanced over at her. The small stick-like pill is Xanax and the small white circular one is Zolpidum. Xanax will help them with their anxiety and depression. While the Zolpidum is a sedative that should help them relax perhaps even put them to sleep, Momo replied, giving each of the girls the medication. Vowing to herself if needed she would give the girls more later, or some other antidepressant that would aid them in their recovery. She knew how to create quite a few different medications. The lizard priest had sent one of his bone warriors to the nearby village with a request for a horse and wagon to transport the victims back to the village. A low-level adventurer had come with the wagon and after putting the last girl on board, the driver and adventurer headed home. How could the goblins do that? How could they do something so vile and horrendous? Momo asked watching as the horse-drawn wagon rolled away. Don't they feel any remorse or pity or mercy? She asked as well. Goblin Slayer stepped closer. No they do not. They do not feel any of that for anyone. Goblins are pure evil and do not forget that. For if they had a chance, they would take you captive Creati and they more than likely will not kill you. Instead they will take you as a plaything and after they are done with you dot 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 you may be alive but you will not be alive inside. Goblin Slayer said sternly wanting to make sure that Momo understood. So do not show them mercy or pity. Just kill them. That night back at the same camp that they had stayed at the previous night. Izu, Deku can I talk to you alone? 
Momo asked and led him away from the others. She was still disturbed about the amount of death that the others had dealt out against the goblins. Though after seeing what the goblins had done to the captives, she no longer believed that the creatures did not deserve what they received. Are you alright? Izuku asked, worried about her and was not ready for Momo to throw her arms around his neck, hugging him tightly against her. She pushed her face into the crock of his neck and his arms automatically encircled around her back. She began to cry. It, it is dot 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 too much, Momo said sobbing. The death dot 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 the wanton death dot 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 what those things dot 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 did to those. Girls, she wailed and Izuku swallowed heavily, then held her more tightly against him, knowing she needed to be comforted and reassured, though he did not know what to say to her to make her feel better. Um Momo dot 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 back on our world. There are horrors but not as bad as here. Izuku considered what else to say. Perhaps that is the best way to keep those horrors from inflicting death and destruction upon the residents here. That it is necessary to be dot 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 to be ruthless. Momo moved slightly back and looked at him, closing her eyes. I do not want to be ruthless. I do not want to dot 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 want to kill indiscriminately. Momo said sadly and Izuku fully understood. He did not want to do that either. But we may have to show no mercy and kill. Otherwise there will be dire consequences that would be our fault. Yes and even though it is different here dot 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 the adventurers are the heroes here. They protect the weak from the horrors of this world. So if we intend to be heroes dot 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 we must adapt and be like heroes here. Which means we have to kill when necessary and from what we have witnessed dot 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 the goblins have to be eradicated from existence. Izuku said trying to rationalize the reasons that they would have to be like the others here and do something that they both considered to be vile. Something that neither ever thought they would ever have to do. So are we going to ask dot 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 ask those back there to join them in their fight against the goblins? Momo asked and Izuku looked over at the others a good 50 meters away. From what we witnessed at the village and at the cave dot 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 the goblins are a scourge to all those here dot 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 they prey on others and according to Goblin Slayer they show no mercy or pity with their victims. In my estimates they are far worse than the League of Villains or anyone else that is a villain from our world, Izuku said and Momo had to agree, then pulled herself once more against him into a hug placing her chin on his right shoulder. Izuku dot 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 can we dot 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 can we be more than dot 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 just friends? Momo whispered into his ear and Izuku stiffened. Hope flooded through him also absolute terror. He had no idea how to be with a girl. In, in, in what way? Izuku whispered back his voice etched with anxiety. Swallowing and blushing madly, Momo giggled, finding it funny as she felt how hard his heart was pounding in his chest. In a more romantic way of course, Momo said and Izuku's knees buckled slightly, feeling faint. Izuku we may be here the rest of our lives and I, I do not want to face that reality without you. Now if you want we can take it slow and easy dot 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 but I do want to dot 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 date you. She told him and he swallowed heavily again, then nodded. Okay, Izuku whispered unable to really say anything else. He did feel like he could hurdle both of the moons in a single bound in celebration. After hugging for a few more moments they returned to the camp. Back at the guild they would ask if they could join Goblin Slayer and the others in their quests, even if it meant eradicating goblins. Zero. Upon the group's return, Momo and Izuku inquired about joining them. Before Goblin Slayer could say whether or not to allow them, the priestess stated that they would need to discuss it, trying to get Goblin Slayer to once more discuss important issues with the group rather than just assuming that they all would accept those issues. While they did, the two left to seek out accommodations with their share of the quest payment. Momo carried a small list that Guild Girl had given them. On it was moderately priced apartments with pricing. We might have a problem Izuku. I do not believe that either of us can afford a separate apartment or housing. I think our best option is to. She paused nervously and then blushed. Is to. Share an apartment. She blurted out the last words and Izuku gasped audibly. Almost tripping on his own feet. I. I do not know dot 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 if dot 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 that is. A good idea. Izuku said back nervously. Now really stammering and Momo smiled. What other option do we have? Separately we do not have the funds to afford an apartment. Together we can at least afford one that is not infested with vermin. Momo stated pointing to the least expensive. Guild girl had been nice enough to inform her about some on the list that were nothing more than slums. Rooms that were more fit for livestock than people. Closer to being a stable than a home. The moderately priced ones were more acceptable. But neither could afford them separately and living together was exactly what she wanted. At the first apartment, Momo searched it thoroughly checking and rechecking crevices and finding a couple of holes in the walls. She shook her head, rodents and by the size of them, rats. With that they went to the next one on the list, which she declined due to the location and the condition of the outhouse. It was too close to the building and had only a tarp for a door. The last one on the list was a little more expensive than the others, but from what she could tell it was the most suitable for the time being. I guess this is the best option for us. No sign of vermin. The outhouse is far enough away and it fully enclosed with a door. 
I do suggest that we clean the room thoroughly and disinfect the bed along with the blankets before we use them. She suggested and Izuku nodded, unable to say anything at all. The owner of the building stood at the door waiting. We will take it. She dropped almost all of their money into his hand and he smiled pleasantly, then handed her back two coins. I do not charge adventurers the full amount dot 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 also if you run short once in a while. Don't worry about it. I was an adventurer and I know how it is. The man with a missing left hand that ended in a stump said, Thank you sir. Izuku said bowing and the man smiled then introduced himself as Spike Hand, telling them back when he first lost his left hand. He had a strap on spiked mace on his left hand, so he could continue to be an adventurer. Be careful if you ever take a quest to get rid of a desert sand sharks dot 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 they are small as a goblin but can pop up without warning and attack in a blink of an eye. The man advised them, showing his stumped left hand, then with a chuckle left so that his new tenants could move in. Izuku could not stop from looking at the bed, which caused him to hyperventilate. Sure he had agreed to become romantically involved with Momo, but the sheer idea of them sharing a bed was going to send him into convulsions. He doubted he could do it for he had not even kissed her yet. The hug last night almost ended him and here they could have to sleep right up next to each other. Slowly glancing over at Momo who was checking over the room once more, he caught her eye and he swore he saw a gleam in her dark eyes, along with a small wry coy smile. I am so screwed, Izuku whispered, no chance, staring into the cell. Awaza and Midnight could not come to terms on what they saw. They had tried several different strategies and interrogation methods in an attempt to convince Asakaki Tashinyaki to bring Momo Yeirazu and Izuku Midoriya back. Now to do that was impossible. How? How could the guards let this happen? Midnight asked her voice low, wanting desperately to understand how it had happened. Inside the cell Tashine Aki hung from the ceiling by a rope made from his jail cell cot sheet, dangling a good foot off the cement floor. The prison doctor had left ten minutes ago right after pronouncing that Tashine Aki was dead. What do we do now? She whispered, remembering somewhat the deluded man had said, that Yeirazu and Midoriya were not on this world, he had sent them to another that he was the only one that could bring them back home. Iwaza lowered his gaze and shook his head. Perhaps I pushed him too far. I thought I could get him to dot 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 to bring them home. Iwaza said in anguish, blaming himself for trying to intimidate Tashinaki into bringing the two teenagers back, informing the man that the prosecutor was going to charge him with murder and then ask for an extremely long sentence. It had been a bluff and now Iwaza knew that the bluff had backfired. This is my fault, he whispered. My fault. Midnight shook her head. No we both agreed as did the director of the Hero Administration to be more aggressive in the interrogation. How would any of us suspect that Tashinyaki would, would kill himself rather than? Midnight's voice trailed off, as two guards entered and cut him down. Two others with a gurney stood ready to wheel the dead man to the morgue. The last chance to bring Yeirozo or Midoriya back home was now gone. That meant they would have to inform the families that their loved ones may be alive, but there was no way to return them. Because the two pro heroes slash teachers did not realize how insane Asakaki Tashinyaki was. The first night, cleaning the room and washing the bed mattress and blankets took the two about four hours to complete. Momo had created bleach to ensure not only the room was disinfected but the mattress and blankets did not contain any type of vermin within them. For they really soaked them in two gallons of bleach to make sure. Now the entire room smelled of bleach and that confirmed that the room was now as clean as they could get it. Picking up his sleeping pad and blanket. Izuku laid it out across the room far away from the bed. What do you think you are doing? Momo asked making the bed with the now clean linens and blankets. You take the bed. I will sleep here on the floor. Izuku said and Momo shook her head. Come on Izuku dot 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 we said we are going to be romantically involved dot 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 we can sleep in the same bed. That is if you behave yourself for I promise that I will behave myself. So there should not be a problem with us sharing the bed. Momo said the last with a large smile as Izuku stared at her, swallowing heavily. His face turned a bright shade of red. How about this? There are three blankets. I will get under the bottom blanket. You lie on that one and get under the middle blanket and the third one covers us both. The blankets will keep us from touching each other. She suggested and he found that her suggestion was a good idea. Though he was still nervous about sharing a bed with her. With a reluctant nod, he agreed to the idea. Laying under his lair, Izuku strained to keep himself to the left side of the bed, placing his left foot on the floor so that he did not accidentally roll over too close to Momo. They both were exhausted for it had been a long day, but he was having trouble dozing off. He had never been in bed with a girl before and here he was lying next to in his estimates was the prettiest girl he had ever seen. It somewhat alarmed him that here on this world, they were considered adults, so this was actually allowed. Not that it made it any easier on him. What he found interesting was that Momo did not have to be a hero or an adventurer here on this world if she did not want to. With her quirk, she could create things that the people here would pay a great amount of money for such as Bic lighters, but like him she wanted to be a hero and not a merchant. 
What also kept him awake was that tomorrow Goblin Slayer and the others would tell them if they can join their party. Not that he was thrilled about the idea of going on quests that focused on goblins, but he and Momo both agreed that the goblins were probably the worst threat this world faced. With a deep exhale, he closed his eyes and tried once more to relax enough to get some sleep. In the morning and after breakfast prepared by their landlord's wife, which consisted of biscuits and ham, Izuku and Momo went to the guild, where they were meeting with Goblin Slayer, the priestess, the elf, the dwarf and the lizard. They had been told to meet with them this morning about if they would be able to join their party. Izuku was a little concerned that he might not be accepted, since on the last quest he did not really do much other than collecting firewood. Momo on the other hand had showed her value. Entering the guild, they both glanced around and Momo shrugged. Guess we are early, she said gesturing to one of the tables. There they sat to wait. After a minute he looked over at the quest board and noticed that there were some new ones posted. Standing, I am going to check the board. That way when they arrive if there is a goblin one, I am sure Goblin Slayer will want to know about it. Izuku said and Momo shook her head. Okay dot 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 but also look for one that we can handle. I just do not want to go after goblins. Momo said and with a nod, Izuku walked over to check the board. While he was gone Guild Girl came over and inquired if she wanted anything to eat or drink. Of course she did and the other girl went to get her order. Waiting she gazed over at Izuku who was still looking at the board. Not hearing someone approach her from the left. Hey there girly dot 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 you kinda look lonely here all by yourself. A gruff sounding man said and Momo looked to the side towards the sound of the voice. A bearded man, holding a battle axe and about ten years older than her leering down at her. She noticed the sneering smile and did not like how he was looking at her. Though she had been gawked at before by others in the same manner, and she was repulsed by that look. It was the type that in her experience bordered on perverse, believing at that moment the man was having some very vivid ideas on what he wanted from her. No I am not. My partner and my companion is right there. Momo stated pointing over at Izuku and the man laughed sarcastically. That boy dot 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 you cannot be serious. My legs are bigger than he is and I bet I am better suited for you dot 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 as a quest partner. The man wiggled his eyebrows and smiled toothily. Bed companion than he could hope to be. He laughed again, which drew Izuku's attention. Walking back to the table. Can I help you with something? Izuku asked and then noticed the man's ranking tag. It was Sapphire. At the same time he knew the man looked at his. The man swung his large axe down onto the floor and leaned on the handle heavily. Yes you can boy dot 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 you can depart and leave this tender young girl with me. The man said in a gloating voice, flexing his muscles in an attempt to intimidate Izuku and hoping to impress Momo. Otherwise I might have to physically toss you out the door. The man laughed again, then stopped when Momo began to laugh. You picked the wrong person to try to intimidate. Momo said between chuckles and gazed fondly at Izuku. Try not to hurt him too badly dot dot at most I think a small demonstration will suffice. She suggested to Izuku and then pointed at the axe. He nodded with understanding and then activated 10% of all for one, feeling the energy flow through him. With heightened speed, he grabbed the axe right out of the man's hand and roared with rage, until he watched Izuku twist and bend his metal axe into a pretzel effortlessly, handing it back to the man, who gasped at him wide-eyed. Keep bothering her and I will do the same to you. Now go away. Izuku said to the man who made a hasty retreat. That was impressive Deku, especially since from what I could tell dot 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 that was a magic axe. Goblin Slayer said in front of the others who were staring at Izuku, clearly impressed. His strength matches that of the ancient brontosaurus dot 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 to witness a mere human who has that much power. I am blessed, the lizard priest said and with the others they joined Izuku and Momo at the table. The priestess looked directly at Goblin Slayer and she knew that his mind was considering how he could use Deku's strength in the fight against goblins. Last night she suspected in his silence as he listened to the others debate whether to allow the two others to join them. He on the other hand was not going to allow Deku to join, believing that the boy did not really have anything to offer. Kriyati on the other hand proved to be quite valuable. I still think we should welcome both of them to join us. I for one would not mind having another female among us, the elf said with a determined smile. As do I I like the fact that she enjoys good food and drink as much as I do. The dwarf said reaching over to pluck a sweet biscuit off the plate in the middle of the table. So do you all want them to join us? Goblin Slayer asked and they all nodded. Then it is unanimous. The others smiled over at Izuku and Momo happily. I have one condition before we accept. Momo said. If we join you dot 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 we want to go on other quests than that of just going after goblins. She told them and the elf laughed heartily, slapping the table with her right hand. Ah good another like myself. For I too have pestered Gloomy there about going on some fun quests that are more adventurous than dangerous. The elf said and Goblin Slater once more went silent. Though those that had been on other quests with him knew he was fuming over the idea about going on non-goblin-based quests. But to get the two to join them, he had to agree. 
So once more he was basically being blackmailed to go on a quest that did not involve goblins. Zero. Three days later, Goblin Slayer and the others watched in awe from behind the priestess's barrier as Izuku pounded on a goblin champion, easily matching the monster's strength and from what he could tell, exceeding it. All around his party was dead minor goblins and a few that Momo had stunned with two-meter-long poles that she had informed them was cattle prods that she had increased the voltage to 50,000 volts. Those she hit them with were on the ground twitching uncontrollably. He decided that he would dispatch them later. Right now his interest was on watching the fight with the goblin champion and he was wondering just how strong Izuku truly was. At first when the champion had come out of the goblin's nest and Izuku moved towards it, the priestess gave a warning to Momo. Surprised when the other girl simply smiled and told her that is, Deku can take care of that monster easily. Then as she watched, she was shocked to see that Momo had been right. The big brute roared in fright when Izuku caught its huge club one-handed and ripped the six foot of wood right out of its grip, breaking it in half over his right knee, then systematically began to pummel the creature with relative ease. When the brute had appeared, the priestess felt a shiver of fear. She had confessed a while back to her friend the elf that her greatest fear was a goblin champion and was relieved when the other told her that is natural along with that it is alright. After all she had almost died the first time she encountered one of those monsters that helped her control her fear and overcome it. Now as she watched with fascination as Izuku hit the thing hard and the monster lost half of its teeth, she knew that with Deku in their party she did not have to really fear the champions at all. Standing over the decimated goblin champion, Izuku exhaled and felt his hands begin to shake. The monster was strong, but with him activating 15% of all for one it was nowhere near as strong as him. What that fight did was remind him that he could not be lapsed in his training. He had to get stronger so he could use more of all for one. When Goblin Slayer approached, Izuku turned his back not wanting to watch or witness what the armored man was about to do. Though he did hear the slash of a sword being used and the thud as the other cut the goblin champion's head off. At some point Deku dot dot you and Kriyati have to kill the goblins. We cannot leave them alive. Otherwise it could lead to more death and pain of the innocent. Goblin Slayer said to him and Izuku winced. I know dot dot but me and Kriyati dot 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 where we come from. Killing is just morally wrong. Izuku said back. Knowing that Goblin Slayer was right. It just was difficult for Momo and him to become judge, jury and executioner. Leave him alone Goblin Slayer. If he and Kriyati do not want to kill. I suspect you have no problem doing it for them. The elf said defensively. Not mentioning that the priestess her friend did not kill either. Though for entirely different reasons. Morality is something that some have a hard time ignoring. She whispered mostly to herself. With the quest over and after Goblin Slayer. And the lizard priest ensured that the nest had been cleared of all goblins and the captives had been taken to the nearest village. They headed back home this time by horse and wagon. Leaning back against the side of the wagon. Izuku lightly dozed right up to the point he felt someone move next to him and place their head on his right shoulder. He already knew who it was. Momo. Opening his eyes and gazing over, he smiled. She smiled back and then closed her eyes. It had been a long day and half a night. When we get back dot 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 how about we do something that involves us? I want to go on a date. Momo whispered to him. Swallowing he nervously sighed. Okay. Izuku whispered back to her and then Momo eased herself more comfortably against him and fell asleep. It did not take long for him to follow suit and fall asleep as well. First date. Walking together through the small city, Momo held Izuku's hand with her fingers intertwined into his. They had started their date at one of the inns and now with the sun beginning to set, they just wandered about, neither wanting the date to be over, which they both thought was odd, mainly due to that they lived together in the same apartment and slept in the same bed. Stopping at a bridge where a stream ran below it, she turned towards him and stood right in front of him. Izuku dot 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 I dot 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 can we kiss? She asked and Izuku paled. I have never kissed a girl before. Izuku whispered, blushing now a deep shade of red. Inwardly panicking, Momo giggled. I never kissed a boy before dot 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 so it will be a first for us both. Momo decided if Izuku not to. She was going to mention that the fact that they were living together and sharing the same bed, which was another first for them. She had already figured out that she would have to basically take the lead in their relationship. If she wanted to kiss him, be with him romantically and of course what came later, she would have to initiate it all, doubting that he would or be able to. Stepping closer and watched him turn into a complete mess, but she wanted to kiss him and unless he vaulted over the bridge railing, she was going to kiss him. Moving her arms over his shoulders, she peered into his eyes. Don't faint on me. She told him and leaned closer, turning her head to the left slightly she pressed her lips onto his for their first kiss. She felt his entire body stiffen as she pressed her lips harder against his. With her body now against his, she did not know if it was his heart that was pounding away or it was hers. Parting she smiled at him and licked her lips. He was hyperventilating. Did you like that? She asked him and he nodded vigorously unable to even speak. Smiling she kissed him again. When it began to get darker and hearing that some of the local pubs were starting to get noisy, 
they made their way back home. Their landlord's wife had promised to heat up some water for Momo so that she could take a bath later and she really wanted one. For some subconscious reason she found that she could still smell the old leather armor that smelled like someone ran a marathon in it and never cleaned it afterward, even though she replaced it with the Kevlar armor that she had created for her and Izuku yesterday, so a bath might stop her from smelling it. As they neared the building, she had an urge to ask Izuku to join her, but knew it was too early in their relationship for them to take a bath together. Easy day. Admiring her new ranking tag, Momo smiled. The promotion exam she had just taken had elevated her to Obsidian. Now she waited downstairs for Izuku, who she suspected would also be promoted today. There were others in the room that were also waiting to take their exams, including the priestess who was up for steel rank. So while she waited for Izuku, she chatted with the priestess. Goblin Slayer probably will never say it dot 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 but I know him dot 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 he is impressed with both of you. The blonde girl said as she sipped her tea. Momo smiled at her. Is he always like that dot 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 you know obsessive about goblins? Momo asked and the priestess shrugged. Yes dot dot but that is just how he is. I do worry about him because sometimes he does things that places himself in harm's way to kill goblin. But he tries not to with any of us or he will not with you. The priestess said and Momo gave a soft chuckle. That is also Deku dot dot he will rush in without considering the dangers or the repercussions. Have you noticed the scars on his hands? Momo asked and the priestess nodded. Well if he uses too much of his power, it can backlash against him. Generally it breaks the bones and in worst case scenarios causing even more damage to him. I could heal him if he does. That is one of the holy gifts that I have been given. The priestess said and Momo sighed with relief. She was a little worried that someday Izuku would face a situation where he would have to push his limits to a point that caused irreversible harm to him. Well irreversible here, for she had seen the limits of the medical knowledge they had on this world. Though learning that there were some here that could heal injuries did make her feel better. That is nice to hear, Momo said and then noticed that Izuku was coming down the steps. Smiling he held out his tag and Momo smiled back at him. He had been promoted just like her. He got it. Good. Now all I have to do is hope I get promoted as well. The priestess said nervously. She was unsure if the guild would take in account all of the successful quests she had gone on with Goblin Slayer and the rest. There was still the perception that goblins were not that much of a threat, even with the recent events out at the farm. So she did not know if she would be promoted to steal or not. If they don't promote you then they are idiots. Izuku said sitting down next to Momo, deciding to wait to see if their new friend did get promoted and if she did. Then they would have to celebrate. Standing the priestess squared her shoulders, then straightened her habit robes and walked to the stairs. Good luck, Izuku and Momo said together, then sat back and waited. With being promoted did not really mean that much other than they were now all qualified to take on higher level quests. For Momo and Izuku it meant that they could take quests that were marked for obsidian level adventures and the priestess could go on steel level adventures. Not that they were going to. The three were checking the board, still looking for a quest that did not involve goblins and was more of an adventure that promised to be not dangerous. What some would deem as non-profitable since those did not pay much. I doubt anyone could convince Goblin Slayer to go on this one. The priestess said tapping one that was nothing more than a scouting mission over a week away to the north, laying out a possible route for travelers. The pay for it basically only covered what supplies they would need for such a mission. Still that one could be fun. Momo countered and all they had to do now was ask the elf, dwarf and lizard man to agree. With the others with them they waited for Goblin Slayer. And when he entered the guild, the priestess held up the posted quest. Goblins? Goblin Slayer asked and they all shook their heads. No, but remember when is a condition for me to aid you against that goblin horde? We have found a quest that we all want to go on. The elf said and the priestess handed Goblin Slayer the quest. If I must then I must. Goblin Slayer said evenly and everyone that had been with him, knew he was brooding over what the quest involved. Don't fret Goblin Slayer dot 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 this is going to be fun. The priestess said cheerfully. Well let's get this over with and by the way this counts as the condition of you joining us as well. Goblin Slayer said to Momo and Izuku. Sounds reasonable since it will take a week. Momo said and after gathering their own personal gear, they began their next quest. The scouting quest. All of the others of the party could tell that Goblin Slayer was not completely pleased with the quest, namely due to that it did not involve goblins. But that was what everyone but him wanted, to go on a quest that promised to be nothing really dangerous. It took them two days by wagon to reach the start point where the quest would officially begin. From there they needed to travel north towards the mountains and try to find a route that went through the dense woods, not around them, which would cut down the time it took to reach Mountain Cliff City from the rest of civilization. With over a hundred stakes with red flags on them, they would mark the way, so that later some woodcutters and workers would come to build the road. Placing the first marker near the edge of the woods, they had the elf take lead and search for any trails. This was her domain, for elves had a knack when it came to finding their way through the densest forests. 
since they were born to understand them. Momo and Izuku walked together talking about this or that, mostly hoping to go home one day. He missed his mom and she missed her parents. When the elf stopped and held up her right hand, they all stopped. We got a problem, she announced and pointed down at some footprints in the dirt. Joining her, Goblin Slayer tensed. Goblins, Goblin Slayer said and everyone could hear the anticipation in his voice. Kneeling the elf examined the prints, touching the depth and the outline. These are at least a day old dot 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 one goblin, perhaps a scout. The elf said, that means a small nest. Generally a nest will send out more than just one goblin to scout. Goblin Slayer said, looking up the trail in the direction where the footprints seem to go. It is getting late. We better find a good defensible position. I have no intention of walking into an ambush. At the mention of ambush, the priestess griped her staff tightly in her hands. Here I thought that this was going to be boring. Now he was interested, finding a large cliff face. They set up camp so that their backs were against the sheer rock wall, with the woods in front of them. Momo created some trip flares that she and Izuku set up in possible approaches. At first none of the others had any idea what the trip flares were, until Izuku accidentally set one off while running a trip line. The next thing Momo created was over a dozen flashbang grenades. When I throw these dot 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 do not look directly at them dot 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 if you do you will be blinded for several moments. She advised as she finished creating them. You know if this is a small group, maybe we can capture one or two of them. Izuku suggested. For what reason? Goblin Slayer asked sternly. Well we could interrogate them. Izuku looked over at the lizard priest. You can understand them right. He asked the tall lizard man, who nodded. They won't divulge anything dot 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 they are cowards at heart dot 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 but we would have to torture them to get them to even tell us anything of relevance. Goblin Slayer said and they all knew he would not mind torturing the creatures. But in the end they all doubted the goblins would not be in any condition to tell them anything important. Izuku gave a soft chuckle. Do you know how to make something that would make them cooperate? Such as a truth drug. Izuku asked Momo who smiled broadly. I can make something that would put them into such a stupor dot 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 that they won't be able to even move. Momo said running through some of the chemicals and medications that she had memorized. So that changes what we must do if and when they come. We must capture at least one or two of them. The dwarf said. Yes. Can you put a couple of them asleep? Goblin Slayer asked and the dwarf nodded. Good. Then that is what we will do. An hour later after the sun set, a group of twenty or so goblins attacked under the leadership of a shaman. Within moments it was apparent what the creatures were after and it was the girls. The battle was fierce, but in the end all but two of the goblins lay dead on the ground. The shaman and another were the only survivors. Creating a very potent truth serum called sodium pentothal in a needle, she injected it into the shaman after he awoke. With the lizard man translating, Goblin Slayer asked the magic user several questions that he always wanted to know. The goblin answered them without any real resistance. While the lizard man translated for the shaman, the priestess sat with a pen and paper writing down everything as best she could. In the end they found out a great deal about what the goblin's motives were. We need to report this to the guild and to all the kingdoms. The elf said in shock. They need to wipe out every goblin everywhere. She added and glared at the two living goblins in disgust. They learned that the goblins wanted to rule it all. Slaughter most of the population and turn any young woman elf or human into nothing more than playthings and breeding machines to spawn more goblins. Well we have learned enough from these two. Goblin Slayer effortlessly cut the two goblins heads off and no one even protested. Not even Izuku or Momo. We need to destroy the nest dot 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 from what I could tell from their attack due to they were focused on trying to get to you three. They do not have any live captives. He looked at Momo, the priestess and the elf. I had a feeling that was what they were after. The whole attack seemed to be focused on taking us three captive and taking us back to their nest, the elf said, remembering how many of them came towards her and the other two girls. While only a few attacked the males of the group, only enough to keep them occupied. The goblins were not ready for someone to suddenly rip a twenty or so foot tree out of the ground and slam it on top of them. We will have to return to report this to the guild. So suspend this quest for now Goblin Slayer said and they all could hear how pleased he was about not completing the scouting quest. They also knew that suspension would mean that they would never get him to come back and accomplish this quest. I believe we can finish this quest and send word to the guild at the same time, Sir Goblin Slayer. The lizard man said, turning and tossing a tooth or two on the ground then summoned a dragon tooth warrior. Taking another piece of paper out, the priestess wrote a copy of what they had learned and handed it to the skeletal being. Go, run this back to the guild and hand it to guild girl. The summoner of the warrior commanded and the creation ran off south. This quest continues and let's hope we do not have any more distractions like this. The elf announced and they all heard Goblin Slayer moan softly in protest, storming off to find and destroy the nest. Zero. The enjoyment of going on the scouting quest returned the next day when they came across a slow-moving river and it was decided that they had time to take a bath. 
with the females moving upstream where it curved out of sight of the others. They all removed their clothing and armor to take a dip. Once out of sight, the girls entered the water and after scrubbing the sweat and dirt off, began to just enjoy the cool water. I have noticed that you and Deku seem to be more than just comrades, the elf said with a mischievous smile. Wanting to know details, Momo blushed and dipped down into the water to hide her embarrassment, then rose slightly, just enough to speak. Yes dot dot well I am trying to get him to. I want to be closer and I sort of have to get him to dot 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 him. Momo blushed again and both of the other two giggled, though the priestess also blushed some. Neither of us actually knows how to. I am guessing a lot on how to proceed. She looked at the elf and the long-eared woman thrust up her hands. Do not ask me dot 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 sure I am 2000 years old dot 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 but I have not found a mate yet and I. Wait how did you divert this towards me? The elf said feeling her own cheeks begin to feel hot. Both Momo and the priestess giggled. So she splashed them both and then the splash battle was on. When it was over and a truce was declared, the elf had one more question that she really wanted to know. I do not mean to pry dot 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 but what are your in-game intentions with Deku? She asked and Momo smirked. I intend to marry him of course. Momo declared and her new friends smiled with delight. Other, all but one entered class 1 and paused, bowing towards Midoriya's and Yeyurazu's desks, then sat at their own desks. Yuraka Achako, Toru Hagakir, Kayoka Jiro and Mina Ishido broke down and started to cry. Get fucking over it. They told us that they are not dead. So stop the sad shit. Katsuki Bakugo declared angrily, upset at the whole ritual that the rest of the class had done for the past week, ever since Awaza had informed them of the circumstances and that there was a huge possibility that two of their classmates were gone. Highlighting that neither was deceased, just not here anymore. Come on Bakugo dot 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 we may never see them again. That has to upset you some. His only friend Ijiro Kirishima said sadly and Bakugo just growled. Before the hostile team could respond two strangers entered and moved towards the two empty chairs. Bakugo slammed his hand down onto the desk and stood up from his seat, glaring at the two boys. What the fuck do you think you are doing? Bakugo demanded and the brown-haired arrival looked at him in confusion. We have been transferred into this class from the Tenisken Private Hero Study School. I am Hanji Astogi and this is Rimo Gasakego. The one said making his way over to what was once Izuku Midoriya's seat, while Gasakego walked over towards what was Momo Yeyarazu's seat. Well I do not give a shit who you are. You are not sitting in those seats. Those are Deku and Big B. Beck Hugo was about to call her Big Boobs, but stopped and since he could not remember her name, he decided to just move on to what had angered him. You are not to touch them. So if you want to sit then sit on the fucking floor. Bakugo stated pointing over to the one side of the room. His hands began to spark with minor explosions illustrating his point. Both looked at him completely, confused, while the rest of the class stared at him in utter shock, amazed that he was so adamant about someone else not sitting at Midoriya's or Yeyurazu's desk. They had all heard that two transfer students from another school were coming to be part of class 1 and basically they all felt the same way as Bakugo felt about someone basically replacing their missing friend. Awaza entered and after hearing what he had, offered a compromise. The two new students would sit on two new desks brought in and placed on the far wall of the classroom, with class over at the end of the day. Don't get too comfortable here. When? When Deku and the girl comes back dot 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 you are fucking out of here. Bakugo said to the strangers and then stomped out of the room. None of the others even introduced themselves to either of them, leaving without saying a word to either. They felt the same way as Bakugo, wanting and hoping that Midoriya and Yeyurazu would return. End of scouting quest. Arriving at Mountain Cliff City four days later, Goblin Slayer decided to make sure what they had discovered was reported to the guild, while the others sought out a store to purchase supplies for the trek home, deciding to take the route they had marked since it reduced the trip by two days, even though it was on foot and not by horse and wagon. If they arrived on time at the edge of the woods, where they had started and would be in time to catch a wagon that was going south, Goblin Slayer hated morons and that was what anyone who did not recognize that goblins were a real threat he considered them to be morons. He had made a written report and the idiot at the reception desk simply smiled and told him that it would receive adequate attention, which meant that the man would simply pass it on eventually or not at all. So Goblin Slayer had to remind the jackass that he was a silver rank and that his report was important. He then rejoined the others and they were on their way back home. Once more Momo walked besides Izuku, but this time she grabbed his hand and interlaced her fingers into his. She wanted to move their relationship onto the next phase and that meant more intimacy. Walking far enough behind the couple so that they could not hear them or anyone else in the party could, the elf stepped closer to the priestess, noticing her friend's gaze. You want someone to do that with you dot dot don't you? Maybe Evan kiss you. The elf whispered to her and the priestess blushed a deep shade of red. No, no, not at all. The priestess quickly stated, shaking her head in panic. The elf laughed. Oh sure you do. Don't fret my friend. It is natural to want to have romance. To be with someone and dot 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 do things with that someone. 
the elf said making sure that no one else could hear them. This was girl chat and it was private. The priestess blushed again. Even you? The priestess asked and this time the elf blushed but not as much as her friend did. Yes, like I said, I have not found the one to spend the rest of my immortal life with. The elf inhaled softly and stared at nothing straight ahead. With a sigh, at one time, if I remember it was about 500 years ago, I considered involving myself with a human dot dot his name was Kujo. But I was convinced by some of my clan that if I did dot dot then in time I would only know pain. That if I took him as a mate dot 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 he being mortal would die and I would be left to mourn. We elves take a mate for our entire immortal life. She told her and the priestess looked over at her friend sadly. I am sorry, the priestess said and lightly placed her left hand on her friend's slender shoulder. The elf smiled over at her. It is alright, though sometimes being immortal really sucks, especially when you are around those that are mortal. The elf said and then threw her right arm over the blonde girl's shoulder and gave her a sideways hug. The girl returned it, then they returned to watching the young couple in front of them. The return home, with the scouting quest officially over and the paperwork completed, Izuku and Momo headed back to their shared apartment. Both just wanted to sleep once more on their bed and not worry about goblins for the next two or three days. So once back home, they stored their gear and armor, laying down on their shared bed. Izuku was too tired to be nervous or anxious about being in bed with Momo. Sure the trip back in the wagon was not really physically exhausting, but it was hard to really sleep on the hard boards, so they only lightly dozed at most. In his days at the edge of sleep, he felt something on the right side of his chest and something else wrap around his body. At the same time he felt another something on his right thigh. Too tired to care, he fell asleep, not knowing that Momo was the something that was on him. Her head on his chest, her right arm across him and her right leg on top of his, wanting to cuddle with him. Awakening Izuku still felt the foreign weight upon him. With tired eyes he looked down and what he saw brought him into full consciousness. Tensing, he started to breathe hard, but not enough to disturb Momo. Even though he was near having a panic attack, it was extremely pleasant. But all great things cannot go on forever. There was a purpose of him waking this early. He wanted to get back into his training regime, so that meant he had to get up. Carefully he attempted to ease himself out of her grip. Before he could even move an inch, she gripped him with her right hand and arm tightly, pulling herself even more against him. Where do you think you are going? She said softly with her eyes still closed. I, I, I need to dot 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 need to train. Izuku stuttered nervously and she adjusted her head more onto him, pulling herself with her right leg and right arm more firmly against him. Not happening dot 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 want you here dot 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 so go back to sleep. Momo declared her voice soft. Making it clear Izuku had no choice, he exhaled and slowly moved his right arm around her and she seemed to snuggle more comfortably against him. He was not exactly tired, but he drifted back to sleep. Hours later the sun beamed through the window and Momo finally let him get up, as long as he kissed her a couple of times before she did. As he returned from the outhouse, she went down to relieve her own needs and when she returned he was fully dressed smiling at her fondly. She smiled back. By the way dot 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 we are so sleeping like that from now on. You make a great pillow and teddy bear. She told him. He nervously agreed, blushing a deep shade of red. So with the excuse of getting breakfast, he went down to the nearby inn and while he was gone, she made the bed and got dressed, feeling extremely rested and chipper this morning. The two found the others at the guild, not to check the quest board, but to mainly enjoy the next day or so off. The priestess and the elf made it clear to guild girl that no matter what Goblin Slayer says, she is not to let him see any goblin quests until the following day. Of course she agreed, believing like they did that they needed so much needed time off. So she kept the two goblin quests on her desk and only let certain others know about them. It had surprised them all when Spearman and his partner the witch accepted certain goblin quests, ones that contained Hobbs or perhaps a champion. Spearman had discovered when he fought the champion it gave him a much desired thrill. So he and the witch were more than happy to go on any quests that provided him with the same challenge. Others were also taking more and more goblin quests as well, but they only took them if Goblin Slayer did not want them or if he was not available to take them. Not that his own party minded, fully ready to go other types of quests if any goblin-based ones were not posted. Upon seeing them, you two look extremely rested this morning, the elf said with a huge smile. Good morning, the priestess said as Momo and Izuku joined them. The dwarf was eating and drinking, gesturing for Momo to indulge if she wanted as he chewed on a foot-long sausage. In front of the lizard priest sat three wheels of cheese that he munched on. It is a fine morning, the lizard priest said as he picked up another wheel of cheese and with a huge toothy smile, bit half of it off and chewed in delight. Truly the food of the gods, he muttered and all those chuckled. So what do you two have planned today if I may ask? The elf asked and Momo shrugged. Might check the board for a local quest and perhaps relax some more, though Deku wants to do some training later today. What do you all have planned today? Momo asked back. If you find something that does not involve goblins and if you do not mind the company, 
I will go with you on the quest if you find one that is. The elf said and Momo nodded. The others chimed in that they would also like to come along. Let us not ask Goblin Slayer to join us. He is like a goblin magnet, Izuku said and they all laughed having to agree with that. The scouting quest seemed to almost prove that statement. At that moment Goblin Slayer walked in, went to the quest board and after not seeing any goblin quest turned and left, not saying a word to any of them. He is more stoic than usual, the dwarf said as they all watched their companion depart. None of them could blame him for being more obsessed. Not after learning what they did from that goblin shaman on what the goblins in game was, what the monsters intended for the world, to slaughter a good majority of the inhabitants, turn the survivors into slaves, food and breading stock, not exactly something that any of them liked hearing. Standing Izuku and Momo went to check the board and found a nice easy close by one that involved dispatching a troll that had taken over a bridge to the east. A troll that should not take long to accomplish, the elf said shaking her head. Any number of them could take down or run off a troll in a matter of minutes. Perhaps we should pack a lunch and have a nice picnic once we are done. The dwarf suggested and they all thought that was a splendid idea. The bridge. It took less than a minute to drive the dimwitted troll away. All it took was two tear gas grenades and one flashbang. Lumbering off, bellowing and rubbing its eyes. It left with no real fuss or muss. It won't come back now dot 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 not with how much discomfort you caused it. The elf said with a small smile, having an arrow notched and ready in case the troll decided not to flee but fight. She would then put an arrow into it and ending it right there. So shall we retire over under that tree there and have our picnic? The dwarf asked gesturing to a nearby farmer's field and a tree that grew on a small hillock. While eating the elf and priestess talked to Momo about her own endgame, inquiring about how far she had gone in accomplishing her goal. Another month or so, then, I should be able to persuade him, Momo said and Izuku looked at her confused on what she meant about that. Knowing full well it involved him, especially when she smiled coyly at him and that sent a small nervous shiver up his spine. With the quest and picnic over, they ambled back towards home. Tomorrow it would be time to once more go on goblin-based quests. Not that any of them minded. The monsters needed to be wiped out. Otherwise their ultimate goal might come to pass and that was something that they could not let happen as adventurers. The goblin stronghold. Once more the government did not fully realize the danger it was to allow goblins to run basically amok, so the creatures were able to fester and multiply to a point where it would take an army to eradicate them. Instead of sending an army, they placed a quest for adventures to dispatch the horrible creatures and of course they did not publish how many of them that were there. So when Dragon Slayer and his party arrived, they discovered that there were more than they hoped to handle. Now as they conducted a recon of their target, Goblin Slayer was formulating a plan to destroy the huge nest of over a hundred of them, plus over a dozen hobgoblins and from what they could see, three champions, all under the leadership of a goblin lord. This is a waste of time. There is no way we can win against so many. This is almost like the attack on that farm where we faced almost the same odds. The elf whispered over at her companions and those that were there nodded, all but Goblin Slayer who was still trying to think of a way to eradicate the goblins. Momo created a pair of high-powered binoculars and gazed through them. How many captives do you think they might have in there? Momo asked and Goblin Slayer inhaled sharply through his helm. From the numbers and what we heard from the local villagers dot 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 at least a dozen maybe more. Goblin Slayer said and then Momo located them within the stronghold. Cages containing naked girls were lined against the one wall of the fortress. So with them there they could not even consider letting Goblin Slayer use fire, poison, water or explosives. If he did all the captives would probably die right along with the goblins. Izuku took the binoculars and stared down at the fortress intently, then up at the mountain that was right behind it. From what he could tell the mountain was mostly granite and stone. An idea or plan started to form in his mind. If we could draw them out or at least a large portion of them dot 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 some of us could sneak in and get the captives out. Then Momo could create some really big demolition explosives and place them on that mountain, setting them off to cause a landslide. Izuku muttered not realizing that the others had heard him. Hem that could work. Goblin Slayer commented, looking over at the frowning elf and priestess. They did not like the idea explosives being used, but what choice did they have? This is your plan dot 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 who does what? The armored man asked and Izuku swallowed heavily knowing that the others believed it was a good idea. I think I can draw them out better than any of you could. But it would help if I had someone that can do a long-range attack to really get them angry. Izuku looked over at the dwarf who nodded with understanding. Stone blast. The dwarf said and then Izuku continued. Mo, Freedy and Elf will set the explosives. She can create them and set them in places that would do the most amount of damage. That leaves. Izuku looked at Goblin Slayer, the priestess and the lizard priest. Us three will get to the captives, take out any guards and then get them out of there. Though she will do a protective miracle on the gate so none of those bastards can get in to stop us. 
Goblin Slayer, pointing at the priestess. Then once we are out dot 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 they set off the explosives. Momo gave a short curt nod, then moved closer next to Izuku frowning at him. You be careful. Momo ordered him stabbing him in his chest with her right index finger, sternly glaring at him. You too, Izuku said back to her. Then he and the dwarf began to walk down the trail so that they could come out in the large clearing before the main gate of the fortress, a good 200 meters away, far out of arrow range or anything else that the goblins might want to throw at them. Once there, Izuku powered up to 15% and grabbed a nearby two or three foot rock and threw it as hard as he could at the stone and wood fortress to get the goblins' attention. While at the same time the dwarf conducted his signature stone blast, slamming fist-sized rocks into the side of the walls. After throwing another rock, they had the goblins' attention. The front gate slammed down making a bridge across the moat and almost 50 goblins. Seven hobgoblins and two champions came out. They needed to draw out more of them, so it was time to get destructive. Hefting up a huge boulder the size of a small car and with a grunt, he threw at the goblins, crushing a good ten of them under it as it slammed down on top of some and rolled onto others. That definitely drew the goblin lord's full attention, for he sent more of his horde out, with Izuku and the dwarf shaman providing a distraction. Goblin Slayer, Lizard Man Priest and the Priestess sneaked into the fortress by scaling a side wall, once on top of the wall and dispatching the three sentries quietly. Lizard Priest created two Dragon Tooth Warriors, ordering one of them to protect the Priestess when the time came for her to use holy protection and put a shield at the main gate. They had come up with that right after the time when a goblin champion had injured her. Concealing themselves on the wall they waited until the next group of goblins. Hobgoblins, the last champion and the goblin lord rushed out the gate. Standing she cast the prayer and an indestructible shield formed at the gate. She would keep the shield up as long as she could and then immediately cast another shield to replace the one that fell. At that moment Goblin Slayer, the lizard man and his dragon tooth warrior attacked the remaining goblins inside the fortress. Then after they freed the captives and took them to the side gate, escaping unnoticed by those outside for none of those outside even realized what was happening inside. Part 2 of Izuku's plan had been accomplished. Up on the stony and granite mountain, Momo created C4 high explosive charges that she could set off with a remote detonator, handing one after another to the elf who placed them wherever Momo pointed to. Setting the last of the 20 charges, she created a remote and the two rushed back to the rendezvous, on top of that small mountain where Izuku had conceived the plan. Once there, they waited for the others and watched the small battle below anxiously. Though the goblins were having a hard time of it, Izuku was hurling rocks and trees that he ripped out of the ground at the goblins. While the dwarf fired his last stone blast, the elf light one of her arrowheads on fire and sent it over the top of the clearing signaling for the two to make their withdrawal. Seeing it, Izuku grabbed the dwarf and flung him over his right shoulder. Bending down, he leapt high into the air and as he soared towards them, Momo set off the explosives. All of them on top of the smaller mountain watched as the larger mountain exploded. Huge and small boulders rained down onto the fortress and much of the clearing. The surviving goblins, hobgoblins, champions and even the goblin lord tried to run. But the landslide swept over the fortress and onto the clearing so fast that they barely made it 10 meters before they were effectively crushed under probably a million ton of rock and debris, burying the fortress and the clearing completely as well. Scratch one goblin stronghold, goblin slayer said and sat down to rest. They would have to remain until the lizard priest's creation reached Watertown City 20 miles away and someone came out to transport the captives there to be treated. A journey back home, Momo leaned heavily onto Izuku and decided to wait until they got home to chew him out. During the diversion he had increased his power to 25% and in doing so the backlash had broke some of the bones once more in his hands. But not badly. Even though the priestess healed them, Momo still was upset at him. So she fully intended to punish him for harming himself. Celebration and the Reward the origin of the quest had come from Watertown and Goblin Slayer suspected that the Sword Maiden had sent it out. So when they had returned they were surprised that the fee had been increased dramatically. Instead of 5 gold coins, it was now 30 gold coins, giving each of the party 5 gold coins, which was a small fortune in which it gave Momo and Izuku a way to purchase their own home. Not that they were too anxious to move out of the apartment, but Momo wanted a house or rather a cottage just outside the city. This is perfect, Momo stated as she inspected the cottage with a huge smile which confused Izuku. It was not as nice as the apartment and from what he could tell it needed a lot of work. The other thing that confused him was the amount of food she had brought with them, until she started to create and then he understood completely. She had to really concentrate on remembering every component of the first thing she decided to create. She at first considered a much easier device, but changed her mind when she discovered that the closet's fuel source which was coal oil would not work, so she changed it to something a little more complex. When done she grabbed some smoked sausage and ate. He stared at the engine and gasped. Is that dot 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 is that a solar generator? Izuku asked and Momo smiled at him. 
Yes, now I have several other bits of technology I want to create. Do you mind starting to work on shoring up the roof and the walls? Momo pointed at the ceiling and then the walls at the numerous holes in both. He nodded and went outside where there was some patching material already to be used. Feeling a little curious about what else Momo intended to create, expecting that none of it was of this world. Sitting at the table, Momo created four heavy-duty extension cords, five electric lamps with light bulbs, two electric heaters, a hot plate and was tempted to make a microwave and a small refrigerator, but decided she could always do that later. There was of course a couple other things she really wished she could create, but creating a television and a DVD player would not be feasible. Though she could create DVDs, she could not imprint any movies or shows on them, which depressed her somewhat, for there was a show she really wanted to finish watching. Shaman Sample I was abducted by an elite all-girls school as a commoner sample. It is a funny show and now she regretted not having the time to watch all of the episodes. She had left off on episode 8 right before she and Izuku had gone on patrol and ended up here. With a deep sigh, Momo thought about the solar generator. It was a 16,000-volt capacity output generator and it could handle all the electrical run devices effortlessly. Though she did know she would have to make and attach another set of solar panels for she suspected the two that she had created with the generator might not be enough to recharge it completely. Eating some more of the food she brought, she returned her limpets enough to create the panels and then sat back to rest. Creating so much at once taxed her physically and mentally, mostly mentally since she had to remember from memory how to make each item. Izuku came in breathing hard. He had finished patching and when she looked over at him, she almost fell off the chair. He had his shirt off and she found herself ogling over his physique, his sculptured muscles and hoped she was not drooling. Me likey, me likey a lot, she whispered barely audibly. She blushed as she realized that she was still staring at him even after he drank down some water and as some of it ran down his chest. She came close to gasping with delight at the show. By the time Izuku finished setting up the generator and the panels where the sun would hit the panels all day long, the priestess, the elf, the dwarf and the lizard came to visit and to check on their progress, each interested in the strange additions that Momo had added to her and Izuku's home. They had brought food and drink and as they ate the sun began to set. So when Momo turned on the generator and the lights came on, the four pelted her with questions on what magic had she created. To have light without oil or candle truly amazed them even more. Home front, time flies when you are miserable, spending most their time on their laptops, researching anyone listed that had a dimensional quirk. Most of Class 1A was determined to find someone that could bring their classmates and friends home. But so far they had not found anyone besides Asakaki Tashiniaki that had that quirk. But none of them was ready to give up. Iwaza discovered what all but Kasuki Bakugo was doing and decided to give them the bad news himself. The Hero Administration in cooperation with every country's Hero Administration has conducted an extensive search for someone that has the same or similar quirk as Asakaki Tashiniaki. They have not located anyone. Not that I am forbidding you all from continuing to search or that I want any of you to give up on hoping that Midoriya and Yeyurazu may return. But you do have to realize that. I am sorry it is fruitless for you to continue, Iwaza said and he expected some emotional turmoil. And not for Mina Ishido to stand up. It is not fruitless. I will never give up looking for a way to. Mina yelled and then stormed out of the room, dashing to the bathroom to cry. Kayoka and Toru followed her in an attempt to comfort her. Kayoka glared at Iwaza angrily as she left. Tenya Ada stood. I am sorry about her outburst sir, Ada said bowing at his waist. But she is right. None of us are going to give up searching for someone to bring our friends home. He stated not telling the older man that Mei Hatsum was diligently researching and trying to build something to do just that, fearing that Power Loader or Iwaza would determine it to be too dangerous for her to continue. He wondered what Awaza would say if he found out that Toru Hagakure had sneaked into the Hero Administration Science Division and took pictures of the research they had conducted upon Asakaki Tashinyaki Quirk. He was betting that the whole class but Bakugo would be in trouble since they helped the invisible girl to do that, just so may with the information she needed. No, I am at fault for her outburst. I should not have tried to convince you not to stop. Please accept my apologies and later I will offer them to Miss Ashido as well. Awaza bowed and decided that it would be best to suspend classes for the day, so he dismissed them and went home himself to take a well-needed nap. En route he suddenly heard Mei Hatsum from within the hero support lab yell loudly and angrily. Crap, you piece of shit. Mei yelled kicking the technology she had just built in utter rage. Her baby once more was essentially useless. It did not open a gateway to wherever Asakaki Tashanyaki had sent Midoriya and Yegurazu, so she was pissed. She had spent the last 27 hours building her machine and it utterly was useless. So once more she was forced to start over from the beginning. 
reading over the information and reports that Class 1A had brought her to assist in her research. Outside the lab, Awaza chuckled and shook his head, thinking how foolish of him to accidentally leave a notation about the research the Hero Administration had conducted on Tashine Aki's quirk in plain sight on his desk back in class two days ago, right where everyone in class could see it and know about it. Another day another foot of snow, staring out the window of their cottage that they had moved into three days ago and it started snowing yesterday. Already there was at least a foot of snow outside. Momo shivered even though it was comfortably warm inside her and Izuku's cottage home. The two electric space heaters, plus the fireplace kept it warm inside and what caused her to shiver was how cold it appeared outside. She had at the time accused Izuku of cheating as he used his quirk to fix and repair the walls, roof and floor of the cottage instead of just patching them. Now as the snow fell and the cold, winds blew about, she was happy he did cheat, though he called it training. Either way she owed him a big kiss and hug. Their new friends told them that this was a freak pre-winter snowstorm. Goblin Slayer called it camouflage for a possible goblin attack, stating that the bastards liked this type of weather to conduct a sneak attack on unaware victims. But she doubted that the unintelligent creatures would be stupid enough to do that, especially since according to the thermometer she had placed outside the window indicated that it was 10 degrees below zero. Only a complete idiot would go out in this weather if they did not have to. She whispered and then felt bad about what she had said. Izuku was outside getting firewood, promising that she would really make it up to him for that comment. Pulling the lap blanket more tightly around her, she sighed. I cannot believe we have been here for over two months, she said out loud, shaking her head in disbelief. Two months and four days ago they had arrived on this world and it did not look like that they would ever get home. Not that it really depressed her anymore. If Izuku was not here, then it would have been unbearable. Then she smiled. Tonight is the night. It is time, she muttered and sat impatiently waiting for him to come back inside. Outside Izuku using an wood-cutting axe, split one of the blocks from the stack of wood that sat just outside the cottage under an overhang, cutting the segments into smaller chunks that would fit in the fireplace. He had first dusted the snow and ice off the solar panels that still collected power even under the barely light conditions of the snowstorm that had raged for the past two days almost non-stop. He found it interesting that even though there was about a foot of snow around the generator, the panels only had a light dusting. Another time where it is completely obvious that Momo is vastly more intelligent than me. He muttered, then shivered and got back to splitting the cord wood. She had told him due to the heat radiating from the panels while it was collecting solar energy. Snow and ice will not build up on them, no matter how much snow or ice came down. He had not believed her when she told him that, so when he came out to get the wood, he went over to make sure that the panels were not buried in snow, finding out that she had been right. Glancing at the light window of the cottage he could just make out Momo sitting in front of the fire. She is so beautiful, I am perplexed on why she would want to be with me. He thought but he already suspected he knew the answer. It was because they were both been sent here by that maniac. Otherwise if they were still at home, he doubted that she would ever want to even think about dating him. He did not even want to think about the fact that there was others here on this world more suitable for her than he was. With a large armful of wood, he headed back inside, stacking the wet wood by the fire. Izuku went to the other side and placed several of the already dried wood onto the fire. When done he sat down on his chair that was right next to Momo's. Pulled out there, Momo asked and Izuku nodded. I will make you some tea dot dot that will help warm you up, she said, and went to boil water on the hot plate, deciding later she would make a coffee maker. The hot plate took twice as long to boil water. When done she handed Izuku a cup of tea and with her own, sat back in her chair. Maybe we should have gone with the others on that quest. Izuku inquired and Momo shook her head. No way, too cold and they are going even further north towards somewhere called Ice Cap Mountain. Also we were not requested in that letter from those nobles, so if we went we would not get paid. Momo said, but she suspected that the others would have split their fee with them upon return. She did worry some. The letter said something about locating another adventurer called Noble Fencer that had gone on a quest to fight goblins and had disappeared with her party, wondering perhaps if she and Izuku should have gone due to that their friends were going once more into a situation where they had no intel about how many goblins that they might encounter. If the goblins had defeated the other adventurers then it could be extremely dangerous. Still maybe I should have at least gone. Izuku said softly though he would be reluctant to leave Momo alone if he did go, fearing that she might succumb to someone else's advances, such as Spearman who last time they were at the guild had asked her out to dinner. Then there were others that asked her out on other occasions and as far as he could tell they were a lot better looking and more accomplished than he was. And leave me alone. No, if you went dot dot then I would go too. It is a moot point anyhow. They have been gone for a day already. Even if we tried dot 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 we would not be able to catch up with them. Besides if they do need our help. I gave Priestess an emergency transmitter and showed her how to use it. Momo held up the receiver for the transmitter. This goes off, then we will go. She told him and he relaxed some. So until then dot 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 want to beat me at chess again. 
Izuku asked gesturing at the chess board and Momo shook her head. They had played several times already and she was bored with beating him repeatedly. Not that he threw the games or let her win. She was just better at the game than he was. How about backgammon? Again she shook her head. No more board games. Momo stated and inhaled softly, deciding it was time. Time for their relationship to advance to what she wanted. Izuku can I ask you something? She asked softly and he looked over at her and nodded. Yes, Izuku replied nervously. When she had that look in her eyes and the way her expression became serious, always made him nervous. She bit her bottom lip and then reaffirmed her resolve. Do you love me? Momo blurted out and waited. Izuku gasped and paled to the same color as the snow outside. It took all of his willpower to nod. Why? 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 E, e, e. S, S. Izuku stuttered now feeling faint that he actually replied that he did. Momo smiled at him. Do you love me enough to marry me? Momo asked more sure of herself than before and Izuku started to hyperventilate uncontrollably. Before he could answer, he dropped front first onto the floor unconscious. She stood and then knelt by his prone body, checking his vitals. Ah good he only fainted. For a second there I thought I killed him, she said with a giggle, creating some smelling salts. She waved it under his nose, determined to get an answer to her question. The answer, moving the smelling salts back and forth under Izuku's nose, Momo found it funny that he had fainted. She knew she was rushing their relationship. But she did not think of a reason why to wait, especially with the fact neither knew if they could ever return home. She had rushed the relationship far beyond her comfort zone for that reason, changing her whole personality for that reason and forcing Izuku to also go beyond his own comfort zone. She wanted to mention that marriage here was completely different than that of home. Here dating for a long period of time was not exactly necessary or practical. She had researched it by asking the apartment landlord's wife and a few others. She discovered that most of those that were married here that it was nothing more than common law marriage and that there was no prolonged courtship. Though if either a man or a woman wanted to they could be married by ceremony. Or just by common law whenever they pleased. Unlike their world, she and Izuku were considered adults. They could be married and have children without any fuss or muss. In fact she and Izuku since they lived together could be considered already married regardless. But what she really wanted was to have their friend the priestess conduct the bonding ceremony instead of just going under the common law, just to finalize that they were married. When he groaned, he opened his eyes and peered up at her. I am waiting, she declared and he felt faint again. What could he say? Izuku had not expected Momo to ask him that. Sure he had said yes when she asked him if he loved her, in which he did. But then for her to ask to marry her, that sent him into his classic panic mode, causing him to faint. I cannot believe I fainted. He thought feeling embarrassed that he did faint. Now though he had a much greater problem. She was waiting for him to accept or not. He knew if he said the wrong thing, such as to decline, then it was highly possible she would not take it well. Yes he figured she was rushing their relationship a lot, skipping over in their world a long courtship of dating and having moving their romance at a normal pace. But here on this world, there really was no need to do that, especially with what they did for a living. The adventurer's life was not a guarantee that it would be a long one. That was the only big similarity that their world had with this world, for it was the same as being a hero in their world. At any time a hero could be killed. He looked at Momo and noticed that she was still waiting for an answer. After several moments, so how about it Izuku? Do you love me enough to marry me? Momo asked again and he began to pale again. Please don't faint again. If you do not want to just tell me, I promise I will not be upset. Which was untrue, it would upset her. But she did not want to really pressure him into accepting. If he did say no or not yet, then she would take it in stride and wait, though she would have to go somewhere else to cry. He swallowed heavily and took a deep cleansing breath. Momo, I, I do love you dot 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 and dot 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 and I do love you, enough to dot 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 yes dot 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 I will. Izuku forced himself to stutter out and Momo dove onto him, pushing him onto the floor and kissed him with all of her built-up passion, grinding her teeth against his. Parting they both were breathing hard and she stared intently into his eyes. As soon as dot 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 as soon as the priestess comes back dot 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 we will have her do the ceremony. Momo said as she tried to catch her breath and as soon as they both did, she kissed him again, both hoping that whatever quest that their friends had gone on, that they ended it quickly and came back really soon. Parting again, Izuku held Momo tightly in his arms and smiled. I got to know Momo. Why are we? I mean I want to dot 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 but we have time dot 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 so why? Izuku was not sure how to word what he wanted to know. Momo did though. Why do I want to rush it? It comes down to our situation here. We have been here over two months and we have to face the reality that we may never get home. We both have had this deluded hope that either the man that sent us here would bring us back or by now they would have figured out what happened and made him bring us home. 
That has not happened, so we need to get on with our lives. Momo took a breath, then continued. So to do that I believe it is best that we forget how it is done in our world with a prolonged courtship of dating and just skip right to us being married. She held up her hand. Now I am willing to wait too. She blushed. To have sex until we both are ready. But it makes logical sense that we are married since we already live together. So we might as well be married. She did not want to mention that she was tired of all the men that when Izuku was not around tried to come on to her. Here it was worse than back home. They were more persistent here and she also was worried that there were girls that she had noticed eyeing Izuku in a way that made her hackles rise. Okay I think I understand why now. Izuku said even though he didn't really. All he knew was that Momo wanted to and that was reason enough for him. The snow stopped coming down late that night but it was still cold outside. Though there still was huge snow drifts almost everywhere and the path that led to the road leading into town was buried under at least two foot of snow. Stepping outside together, Momo wrapped her arms around the heavy thermal winter coat that she had created. She had made one for her and one for Izuku, who was wearing his. The RRR it is still cold out here. She said her breath coming out in steam. I am tempted to just turn around and go back inside. Perhaps ask sweetly for my fiancé to go get the supplies. She smiled over at him and Izuku chuckled. That is up to you. I am more than willing, Izuku said and Momo considered taking him up on that but then thought about the store owner's daughter that would be there and she decided not to chance it. The red-haired girl was attractive in the last time that they were there. The girl had made some not-so-subtle advances towards Izuku and she felt her jealousy once more rise, trudging through the knee and sometimes thigh-high snow. Izuku had volunteered to blaze the way creating a path that made it somewhat less strenuous for Momo. The snowpants and winter boots she had created and they wore kept them warmer than any of the local winter gear. Still it took them almost an hour to reach the edge of the city. Smoke billowed out of every chimney and they barely saw anyone on the snow-covered streets. Just about everyone was remaining indoors and only went outside when it was absolutely necessary. Nearing the guild, they went inside with the intention of warming up and checking on if the others had returned yet. Then they would travel on to the store for the supplies they needed. Once inside, the two found the guild was almost packed with adventurers, drinking and eating. The quest board had very little on it. Most were quests that were posted last week, with only two or three new ones. All of them were low-paying and were not that essential. Momo checked it as well and was relieved that they had money left over from their last quest with the others that they did not have to resort to taking any of them. For the ones on the board were all outside and that promised only that whoever took them would spend a few hours perhaps half a day in the element. Their next stop was the store. Thankfully the store owner had the foresight to make sure he had a surplus of supplies. Though from what Momo heard from the man's daughter he did that every year filling his stockroom with as much as it could hold during the spring, summer and fall seasons, purchasing salted and smoked meat, some dried vegetables and of course rice. Her and Izuku had enough for another two weeks, though they would make another storeroom way before then. She went under the old adage, it was better to have it and not need it, than need it and not of it, packing the supplies in a backpack. She and Izuku chatted with the store owner and his daughter for a bit. She made sure that the other girl kept her distance from him, then once more braved the cold to go back home. Zero, with nothing really to do other than sit and talk, which was not a bad idea. For Momo wanted Izuku to get comfortable enough to no longer look like he was about to turn into a complete mess. She decided that it was time to once more create another type of generator, a hydroelectric type, since she discovered that the nearby stream continued to run regardless on how bad it snowed. With it completed, she had Izuku carry it out to the stream and she searched for a good spot to install it, feel like doing some digging. She asked him pointing to where there was a small waterfall and on the side of the bank. While he went for a shovel, she moved some flat rocks that they would be using to keep the generator off the ground. When he came back, she told him what had to be done. It did not take much digging, just enough to make a semi-flat surface, placing the flat rocks to make a platform. He placed the generator onto them. It took some adjustment and the water wheel was under the flow of water and began to turn. It took several minutes for the generator to gain enough power to start and while it did that, she created two 100-feet extension cords. They ran them back to the cottage where she connected the cords to a breaker box that she had created a few days ago. Now they had two sources of power and could run more of the appliances than just the electric heaters, one electric lamp and the hot plate at one time. Returning once more to the guild a day later, they found their friends feasting with another girl. Momo noticed the girl had a saddened aura radiating from her. She was curious but decided to ask about the girl later. Sitting with them, the elf and the dwarf spun the story of what they encountered on their last quest, remarking that they should have had her and Izuku along. Though of course Goblin Slayer had devised a plan that was not only reckless but dangerous as well. It could have signaled us and we would have come to help. Momo commented gesturing to the emergency transmitter that the priestess wore as a necklace around her neck and the small black cigar-shaped device. No time. With that goblin paladin, there was not enough time to wait for you to get there. 
Goblin Slayer said, though he had thought about having the priestess signal them after they found Noble Fencer, calculating that even with Izuku carrying Momo the distance at the speed he could have used, it would take half a day for the two to get there in time to aid them. So when the priestess inquired about signaling them with that strange item, he decided it was not feasible. Still Goblin Slayer, I doubt that we would have had to resort causing an avalanche to destroy those goblins if Deku and Kreedy were there. The elf said and Noble Fencer looked at the two new arrivals closely, noticing their rank tags. I do not understand. You four are silver ranks. How would having these two obsidian ranks there make that much of a difference in how Goblin Slayer dispatched those goblins? Noble Fencer asked and Momo smiled, gesturing first over at Izuku. Well he is remarkably strong. In fact he probably is the strongest person on this world. Momo then pointed at herself. And I can create anything that I know how to create. From explosives to advanced technology that this world has never seen before. She did not mind gloating a little bit, especially about Izuku. The young woman stared at them both wide-eyed, then over at the others. It is true, the priestess stated, giving a quick tale of the other times that Izuku and Momo had gone on a quest with them, recounting how Izuku threw large boulders a good 200 meters effortlessly, and before that when he fought a goblin champion just as effortlessly, then about Momo and how she created what she called gas grenades and later explosives that turned a mountain into a crater. To demonstrate that she could do this, she created a simple Bic lighter and light it. The others stared the flame in complete awe. Then why do they do not have a higher rank? If they are as powerful as you claim, should they not be steel rank or higher? Noble Fencer asked still staring at the flame and Guild Girl overheard her, so she decided to answer. That is how the guild works, miss. You should know that. Kreati and Deku may have incredible abilities, but the guild has to follow the rules and they have to go through the same promotion examination process as everyone else does. Guild Girl said then smiled, though I should tell you too that you are up for another promotion. All that remains for the oral examination and of course the paperwork. She told them and then served the mugs of ale from her tray, leaving to serve ale to other tables. Hey that is good news, the priestess said with a huge smile. Momo smiled as well. I have better news than that. Me and Deku are getting married. That is if you are willing to do the bonding ceremony. Momo said chucking lightly as Izuku paled and then blushed. The blonde girl gasped excitingly. Yes, yes of course. Congratulations. The priestess said loudly. That is a reason for us all to celebrate. I Goblin Slayer. The dwarf reached over to his cast to fill his mug once more, drinking heavily from it. The elf laughed. Like you need a reason to celebrate. The elf declared and everyone laughed. Marriage. What might that be? The lizard priest asked and the elf explained. Ah that is not how we lizard men do that. We do not have one single mate, but several. It is better that way so we can have several children at once. He said proudly. Not that I have any at present. I am still trying to elevate myself to dragon. You're lost scaly. One dwarf woman is always enough for a dwarf man. The dwarf drank down another mug. So when do you want to do this? Remember it has to be done outside and blessed by water, dirt, air and fire. The priestess asked and Momo glanced outside. Not while it is snowing. If we are to be dosed with water, I would prefer that it is not 20 degrees outside and snowing. Momo stated subconsciously shivering at the thought of the priestess pouring water on them while they were outside in the cold. Oh and when we do, do it. I would like it that you all attend. She looked over at Noble Fencer. You two are invited. She said to the girl and the other girl smiled. Then you will have to do it soon. For I will be departing in the next two days. Noble Fencer said and Momo looked once more outside. Deciding on tomorrow at noon. Right outside her and Izuku's cottage. The ceremony. Momo was both happy and miserable at the same time. She was happy that she and Izuku were about to get married. But she also was miserable because she was freezing. With only a white robe on, rather than her winter coat, pants and boots. The winter breeze and chill made her regret having their friend the priestess conduct the ceremony. Thankfully Izuku had the foresight to shovel out a spot for them to stand in. Rather than standing in a foot or so of snow barefoot. It was still made her feet tingle from the cold ground. Standing facing each other, with their hands clasped. The ceremony began. We pay homage to the Earth Mother to grant these two to become bonded in marriage. Thus I bless this union in your name with water. The priestess took a crystal cup, dipped it in water and tossed the cold liquid on them. Both sputtered and felt their hair freeze. Whose I bless this union in your name with the earth. Reaching down onto the ground she gripped a handful of dirt and tossed it on them. Thus I bless this union in your name with air. Fanning them with her palms, she continued. And finally, thus I bless this union in your name with fire. The elf handed her a candle that she had kept light and the priestess ran the flames under their joined hands, not burning them. She blew out the candle and smiled. With the blessings of water, earth, air and water, I pronounce you bonded forever, let none separate you and may you have a happy life together. Congratulations. It was over and to keep to their own customs after becoming married. They kissed quickly. Momo let go of his left hand and turned back to the house. Let's all go inside. 
I am completely frozen, Momo said leading Izuku and with the others right behind inside. She immediately turned up the electric heaters and grabbed one of the polyester blankets, wrapping it around herself. When he sat down on his chair, she sat down on his lap which caused him to blush a deep shade of red and turning him into a blubbering mess. Take it easy Izuku. We are married now so relax. She whispered. Noble Fencer stood staring at one of the electric lamps in total fascination with her mouth gaping open. What is all this? I have never seen anything like this before. Is this some type of unknown magic? Noble Fencer asked then gestured around her at all of the unknown things within the cottage. Creati made them and from what she told us dot 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 it is not magic but science. The priestess replied and now Noble Fencer went back to examining the lamp. While the priestess, Elf and Dwarf placed food and drink on the table for them to celebrate their friend's marriage, though they would only remain for a short period time, suspecting that the newlyweds would want to be alone. Goblin Slayer stood off to one side leaning against the wall, with his arms crossed. He had come only because it was expected of him to come, otherwise he would not have come, preferring to go back to the farm or wait for a goblin-based quest at the guild. It is time for me to leave, but I would like to come back and learn more about these wonders that you have here. Especially after you told me that these marvels are powered by a cousin of lightning called electricity. Noble Fencer had a keen interest in understanding what electricity was so after hugging the priestess, the elf and then Momo. I congratulate you Creati. Deku, may you have a long and happy life together. With that she put on her cloak and left. She had much to do. First she would visit her parents. Then she planned on going to where her comrades and friends had died. To place grave markers. She also wanted to find out what happened to them. Which meant asking a seer she knew about. One that could tell her if it had been her fault that they died. Though she believed it was, it had to be. Because she was the party leader and it was her responsibility to keep them alive. Though knowing what happened would ease her soul. With the celebration winding down, Izuku tried to get the others to remain. Not ready for whatever came next. While well, he was somewhat ready. But kissing and doing more than that, he was not sure he could handle the more. He was uncertain if Momo would be willing to wait, now that they were married. She had told him that she was willing to wait until they both were ready to have sex. But the way she was clinging to him, while on his lap, he believed that she wanted the wait to be over. Feeling lightheaded, he tried not to think about what came next. Unfortunately that was all he could think about. Damn teenage hormones. He whispered silently, then panicked even more when the others left. Take it easy as a coup. I told you that we can wait until we both are ready. Momo said though she was completely lying. She did not want to wait. By this world's customs, they were married. She was married and she was more than ready. In fact all it took before for them to be considered under the common law was that they consummate and then they were considered married. But she believed that having the actual ceremony would perhaps convince Izuku into them being intimate. She could tell that it would take her perhaps just seducing him. Not that she actually knew how to do that. Though she knew the mechanics of them having sex from some instructional videos she watched once with Mina, Toru and Kayoka. Once more going beyond her and his comfort zone. He sighed with relief. But I do expect you to snuggle and cuddle with me tonight, along with a lot more kissing. He paled once more. Zero, back at the guild, while the others made their way over to a table to continue celebrating. Goblin Slayer went to check the quest board, grumbling audibly that there was no goblin-based quests available. Not that they needed the funding, but he believed that the cold winter generally was when the goblins were more brazen. What he did not know was some others had taken the goblin quests prior to him arriving. Spearman and the witch decided to go on one that he believed would be entertaining since it involved a group of about 30 goblins with two hobgoblins, while four emerald rank adventures had taken the other two, so there was none available for Goblin Slayer to go on. Sitting at the table the elf smiled and gestured at Goblin Slayer. Should we tell him? She asked chuckling for they all knew about the three posted quests. And who took them? The dwarf shook his head. No we better not. He might not take it well to learn that Guild Girl had not posted them until after he checked them earlier. The dwarf said and then they all lightly laughed believing it best that Goblin Slayer take some time off, which meant that they could take some much-needed time off. They at least wanted time enough for their newlywed friends to have a decent amount of time to be newlyweds, at least two nights and three days. Then Guild Girl would put the postings up normally. That is what they all agreed to do. 